Number 1. Sun Tzu said, The art of war is of vital importance to the state. Philip II of Macedon inherited a weak country but moulded his army into a formidable and efficient force. He used warfare to secure his kingdom before instigating a conquest of Greece. After his death, the empire was passed on to his son Alexander the Great, who ruled over a military campaign that created one of the largest empires of the ancient world. War is a tool for the state to achieve important objectives such as protecting the country and influencing others. Number 2. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence it is a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. During the First World War, Major General Arthur Aitken was sent to capture a port in East Africa. He was overconfident and refused to listen to others with knowledge of the area. The element of surprise was given away by sailing too close to the coast, allowing the opposition to create strong defensive positions. After hundreds of his men were killed, Aitken gave the order to retreat, leaving their supplies for the enemy. The expedition was a crushing failure. If you are not strong and cunning, then others will overrun you. If you wage war unwisely, you will only weaken yourself. Number 3. The art of war is governed by five constant factors, to be taken into account in one's deliberations. These are the moral law, heaven, earth, the commander, method and discipline. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler, so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. Sir Winston Churchill rallied the British people during the Second World War with his rousing words and optimism. His most iconic speech took place before the start of the Battle of Britain fought over the skies of his nation. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. The electrifying effect of Churchill's speeches raised morale and instilled the moral law into his troops and the public. As a result, they were more willing to fight on. The moral law is the unifying cause that unites an army or a nation. When a ruler acts in a moral way, showing fairness in all dealings for their people, then the people will reciprocate, caring in return even to the point of death. Number 4. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. Napoleon Bonaparte began his invasion of Russia with hundreds of thousands of soldiers in his Grande Armée. Many Russian Cossacks burnt crops so they could not live off the land. The harsh Russian winter meant that any troops that hadn't already died of starvation succumbed to hypothermia. The world is made up of opposing pairs, yin and yang. By seeing and understanding these pairs, you can gain an advantage by knowing the real impact of fighting in different conditions. Number 5. Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes the chances of life and death. When Hannibal was deep in Roman territory in Italy, the Roman Senate sent an army under Consul Flaminius to face him. Flaminius was incapable of taking the terrain into consideration. Hannibal used it to his advantage. Pursued by the Romans, Hannibal led them down the valley by a lake. He blocked the far end of the valley and placed most of his troops in hiding in wooded hills on the side. Flaminius marched straight into the trap and Hannibal's troops pinned him against the lake. The result was the destruction of nearly four Roman legions. War is fought on the surface of the earth, and geographic factors need to be factored into your planning. Number 6. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage and strictness. Kublai Khan, ruler of the Mongolian Empire, was taught the art of warfare from a young age. He was also exposed to Chinese culture and philosophy. When he later ruled all of China, he showed restraint when dealing with the people he conquered. Allowing their culture to be respected led to improvements in trade and infrastructure. Qualities and virtues can be found in great leaders from history, whether they fought military battles or not. How you lead dictates whether and how people follow. Your beliefs, values and plans will define how you win and lose wars. A leader with integrity creates passionate, dedicated followers. Number 7. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the graduations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. The city of Sparta was known for its legendary fighting force of Spartan warriors. 
Men from the Kingdom would enter military training as young boys and spend over two decades learning discipline, service and precision. Everything in the Spartan culture existed to serve and strengthen the military might of the city-state. They fought using a tight rectangular formation which gave the Kingdom a strong advantage over other Greek civilizations. When you have a vast number of troops, it is important that each knows where they should be and what they should do. Strict hierarchical organisation is a powerful way to achieve this. Wars are won by far more than fighting. Number 8. These five heads should be familiar to every general. He who knows them will be victorious. He who knows them not will fail. Subutai was a general and the main strategist for Genghis Khan. He gained victory using imaginative and sophisticated strategies, coordinating movements of armies hundreds of kilometres away from each other. Subutai utilised engineers to help build temporary bridges over rivers downstream to outflank his opponents. He tailored his strategy to match the enemy, adjusting his tactics according to the opponents, the terrain and the weather. He directed more than 20 campaigns in which he conquered 32 nations. Armies thrive and die based on what leaders truly understand or misunderstand. Number 9. According as circumstances are favourable, one should modify one's plans. On the eve of the Battle of Waterloo, Lord Uxbridge commanding the cavalry went to the Duke of Wellington in order to learn what his plans were for the next day because, as he explained, he might suddenly find himself commander-in-chief and would be unable to frame new plans in a critical moment. The Duke listened and then said, who will attack the first tomorrow, I or Bonaparte? Bonaparte, replied Lord Uxbridge. Well, continued the Duke, Bonaparte has not given me any idea of his projects, and as my plans will depend upon his, how can you expect me to tell you what mine are? Favourable circumstances are those where the situation suits particular tactics and strategies. Do not blindly follow advice. Understand how the jigsaw works and place the pieces where they fit. Number 10. All warfare is based on deception. Odysseus created a giant wooden horse and filled it with thousands of armed men. He told the Trojan leaders that his gift was an offering to the goddess Athena, whose temple had been destroyed by the Greeks. The gift was accepted and as soon as the horse was safely inside the city walls, Odysseus's men jumped out and massacred the city. Deception appears at all levels, from fate's strategic intent to the individual feints and dodges of swordplay. Number 11. When able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. In the mid-19th century, the British Indian Army often wore white or their iconic red uniforms. Due to casualties they had received, they dyed their tunics to a muddy tan colour using tea and curry. This measure reduced soldiers' visibility from a distance. As humans, evolution has made us naturally deceptive. It has also made us cautious and good at detecting deception. The side which both spots deception and deceives the best wins. Consider each perception of your opponent and find ways of changing this. Number 12. Hold out bait to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. The ancient Mongols were famed for their extensive use of false retreats during their conquests, as their fast cavalry made it almost impossible for an enemy to successfully pursue them. In the heat and disorder of a battle, the Mongol army would pretend to be exhausted, confused and defeated, and would suddenly retreat from the battlefield. The opposing force, thinking they had routed the Mongols, would give chase. The Mongol cavalry would, while retreating, fire upon the pursuers, discouraging them. When the pursuing forces stopped chasing the Mongol cavalry, the cavalry would turn and charge the pursuers. When it appears that you are disorganised and vulnerable, opponents may seek to take swift advantage of your disarray. Traps can be laid for the unsuspecting enemy, but beware the double bluff where the enemy sees your deceptions. They may try to counter your trick with a better one. Number 13. If he is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is in superior strength, evade him. A Royal Netherlands Navy ship was based in Dutch colony waters when Japan attacked in the Second World War. To escape detection by Japanese aircraft, the ship was heavily camouflaged with jungle vegetation giving the impression of a small island. The crew cut down trees and branches from nearby islands and arranged them to cover as much of the ship as possible. Anything exposed was painted to resemble rocks and cliffs. 
To further the illusion, the ship would remain close to shore, anchored during daylight, and only sail at night. It was the last vessel to successfully escape the area. Deception is vital when you are weak and cannot rely on strength. This is the strategy of prey who use disguise to deceive the predator. Number 14. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. The Roman imperial strategy in Germany during the reign of Tiberius had two phases. In the first phase, the imperial commander Germanicus interfered in the internal affairs of the Germans by provoking conflict between tribal leaders. In the second phase, Tiberius withdrew the Roman armies to a defensive position and left the Germans to their own internal infighting. The tribes fell apart and no longer posed a threat to the Roman Empire. Divide et impera, divide and conquer. Concentrated armies are difficult to overcome as soldiers can swiftly be replaced with reinforcements. By breaking them into parts, you remove their ability to reinforce. A small victory can then present you with a powerful gain. In this way, divide and conquer is a common and powerful strategy. Number 15. Attack him where he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. A successful ambush was sprung by Germanic war chief Arminius against the Romans at the Battle of the Turteborg Forest. The Germanic forces took cover in difficult forested terrain, allowing the warriors time and space to assemble without detection. They had the element of surprise and sprang the attack when the Romans were most vulnerable, when they had left their fortified camp and were on the march in a pounding rainstorm. Do not attack with force where the enemy is strongest. Utilise the element of surprise to keep the enemy in a state of confusion and uncertainty. Number 16. These military devices leading to victory must not be divulged beforehand. During World War II, the Allies launched a successful deception plan to fool the enemy into thinking they were going to invade France. The plan involved creating a fake army group complete with inflatable tanks, wooden planes, a fake camp and a notable general that wandered the camp. After the enemy caught on to the fake tanks and trucks that were being used, the Allies snuck in real tanks and trucks and parked them in the same location. This let them build up their forces for an assault without the enemy catching on that they were there. Deception only works when the opposition doesn't realise that it is so. Great secrecy is required, and possibly even deception about the deception. Number 17. Now the general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple before the battle is fought. The general who loses a battle makes but few calculations beforehand. Thus do many calculations lead to victory and few calculations to defeat. Helmut von Moltke the Elder was known to be one of the first military leaders who transitioned into modern warfare with huge armies. He said, No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. In other words, during the heat of battle all plans are forgotten. With this in mind, he came up with a strategy to create several army groups, all of whom would operate independently and create their own plans during battle, while keeping in mind the general objective. Battles are won or lost before they are started. There is much in the way of planning and preparation that is required. If you are prepared for the numerous possible actions of the enemy and the unpredictable hand of luck, then you may take advantage of opportunity and avoid the terrible surprise of being outmaneuvered by the leader on the opposing side. As President Eisenhower said, Plans are nothing, but planning is everything. In planning, knowledge of the other side is critical. Knowing their strength, position and intent helps you make better calculations though you must also always be prepared for the unexpected. Of course, the main plan never survives the battle. When the enemy acts, you have to respond. Yet even plans that are never implemented have their value in preparing you. Number 1. When you engage in actual fighting, if victory is long in coming, then men's weapons will grow dull and their ardour will be damped. If you lay siege to a town, you will exhaust your strength. In 1779, the Spanish and French attempted to seize a British fortress in the Siege of Gibraltar during the American War of Independence. Despite assaulting the city with heavy guns, ships and thousands of troops, the British held firm retaliating with heated shots from cannons, causing mushroom clouds 
and forcing the enemy to finish the assault. After nearly four years of fighting, the Spanish and French forces retired and Gibraltar was held. It was the longest siege the British armed forces ever took part in. Soldiers are not machines and this is one of the reasons war should be short and sharp. If possible, a siege strategy should be avoided as victory in war is achieved with soldiers that are passionate and prepared for battle. Lengthy campaigns will eventually wear them out. Number 2. Again, if the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. Early in the 5th century, the Roman Empire was old and weakening. As the Romans struggled to hold Britain, new people came to England to settle from the area of modern Germany. They were the Anglo-Saxons and many of them first came to England as mercenaries in the Roman army. As the Romans withdrew, the British leaders hired them for protection. The mercenaries were helpful while they were paid, but when the money ran out, they rebelled against the British. War has a cost. The state runs the risk of running out of funds if there is an endless cost of weapons, logistics and wages. Number 3. Now, when your weapons are dulled, your ardour damped, your strength exhausted and your treasure spent, other chieftains will spring up to take advantage of your extremity. Then no man, however wise, will be able to avert the consequences that must ensue. In 1941, the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa, their name for the invasion of the Soviet Union. They were so confident of a quick victory that they did not prepare for the possibility of winter warfare in Russia. The German armed forces lacked the necessary supplies such as winter uniforms and the campaign was delayed due to bad weather and flooding. The failure to achieve victory before the Russian winter set in was a contributing factor in losing the war. Soon after, the Germans also faced advances from allies that took advantage, such as the United States and Great Britain. When weapons are used up, troops are exhausted and supporting resources are gone, you are in a position of great weakness. Such situations should be seen long before they occur, with enough time to allow them to be actively avoided. Number 4. Thus, though we have heard of stupid haste in war, cleverness has never been seen associated with long delays. Fabius Cunctactor, the Roman general, took on Hannibal by judging that Rome could endure a conflict for a longer period of time than Hannibal's forces. He thought that a long campaign in a country away from home would affect Hannibal's isolated army more than his own. By employing the Fabian strategy of avoiding pitched battles with a set time and place, Fabius instead wore down his enemy for a war of attrition by harassing them through battles to interrupt supplies and upset morale. Fabius harassed the foraging parties, limiting Hannibal's ability to attack while conserving his own military force. He also scorched the earth to prevent Hannibal's forces from obtaining food and other resources. Time is needed to think and prepare, but you must also be aware that delay has costs as whatever you do, your resources are being spent. Number 5. There is no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. During the American Revolution, General George Washington suffered early defeats and soon realised that he could not win pitched battles against the superior British forces. He informed the Congress that he planned to change his strategy, avoiding going head to head with the British and instead seeking a long drawn out war. By giving way on the fixed battlefield, Washington saved his own army from destruction until the circumstances changed. There were thousands of casualties on both sides. When the French later assisted, it allowed for an American victory in Yorktown, which led to the British negotiating an end to the conflict. A prolonged battle is not a smart way to fight, even if it finally exhausts the enemy. A war of attrition is expensive and costs are felt long after the fighting has ended. Number 6. It is only one who is thoroughly acquainted with the evils of war that can thoroughly understand the profitable way of carrying it on. One of the most destructive conflicts in European history was the Thirty Years' War, a series of wars in Central Europe between 1618 and 1648. The end result was the death of approximately 8 million people. The war devastated entire regions. Famine and disease led to high mortality in many parts of Central Europe. Regular soldiers in fighting armies and mercenaries looted or acquired money through extortion to get operating funds. This inflicted yet more hardship on the populations of territories that were occupied. The end result of the war was the bankruptcy of most of the states taking part in the combat. It is possible to profit from war, 
plundering as you go being one method, although this can still have a cost through later revenge. Taking pleasure in harming others is an evil trait. Evil people do find their way into armies as this provides a means to their ends. Beware those who fight for their own desire rather than for the love of their nation and contemporaries. Number 7. The skillful soldier does not raise a second levy, neither are his supply wagons loaded more than twice. Julius Caesar was extremely successful as a Roman military commander due to his energetic ability to get things done. He could do everything with astonishing speed and lived at a quicker tempo than the people who he had to compete with. This gave him an enormous advantage, allowing for a greater opportunity for unexpected, unpredictable actions. This clear vision was Caesar's exceptional characteristic. It was the product of remarkable brain power led by an unyielding determination. During the Great Roman Civil War, Caesar went to deal with Pharnaces II, a king who had taken a city that was a Roman ally. Caesar's unusually swift approach brought war quickly and when the clash occurred, Pharnaces' forces were completely overpowered. His victory was so rapid and comprehensive that when he wrote to his friend in Rome about the war, Caesar said, Veni, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. The value of time, specifically being slightly ahead of your opponent, has often counted for more than numerical superiority. After war has been declared, a strong army doesn't wait for supplies or reinforcements. It uses the elements of surprise to swiftly invade, creating momentum, immediately gaining ground. Number 8. Bring war material with you from home, but forage on the enemy. Thus, the army will have food enough for its needs. The Black Prince of England took part in the burning and pillaging of towns and farms during the Hundred Years' War in France. It was known as the Chevauchet Strategy. These rapid pillaging raids plundered the countryside which resulted in the local authority being undermined and hostages being captured. A Chevauchet lived off the land, also stealing livestock as well as causing general mayhem. It is always better to use your own weapons which you know well, but for food and other supplies it can be very helpful to capture these from your enemy. Number 9. Now, in order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there may be advantage from defeating the enemy, they must have their rewards. In an attempt to deepen anger against Germany and her people, in 1940 an anger campaign was devised by the United Kingdom Ministry of Information. This was done to increase resolve against the Germans as until then, the British had little sense of real hostility towards the average German. In a series of broadcasts on the radio, a chief diplomatic advisor said that Germany was a nation raised on envy, self-pity and cruelty, which had finally given expression to the blackness of the German soul. Anger has a chemical effect on the body and the brain. Fear is forgotten and adrenaline courses through the muscles. It provokes a natural state for fighting. Seething anger also motivates troops effectively over the long term. The atrocities of the enemy may be held up and amplified so that they create a longer term hatred that drive the army on until victory is gained. Number 10. Therefore in chariot fighting, when 10 or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flag should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. The Romans were experts at successfully integrating the population of a conquered land. After invading a state, they would conquer it through non-violent means if possible, being lenient but backed by overwhelming force. They would allow freedom of religion, so long as the people also gave loyalty to the emperor. The Romans would build roads, aqueducts and promote trade to ensure lots of people got rich. As the Romans moved into the same territory, their high-class lifestyle became aspirational to the youth, and within a couple of generations, the original culture was consigned to folklore. If war ever took place, as a Roman ally, the conquered state was expected to send men to fight alongside Rome. In most cases, Rome managed to persuade troops from the conquered kingdoms that their best interests lay in fighting on behalf of the Roman Empire, rather than remaining loyal to their own nation. Ensure your troops do not become animals by ensuring they treat prisoners humanely. When the enemy's possessions have been taken, they may be forgiven. Soldiers who are captured and abused will hate you forever, as will their friends and family. Treat them well and they will work with you more easily. Number 11. 
In war, then, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaigns. General Douglas MacArthur was appointed Supreme Allied Commander by the US President in 1945. He accepted the formal surrender of Japan, and for the following six years, he remained in the country to command the occupying Allied forces there and to supervise the reconstruction of Japan. On the subject of conflict, he said, War's very object is victory, not prolonged indecision. In war, there is no substitute for victory. The goal of war is to win, not to trounce everyone and everything. The objective is to defeat the opponent, not to fight forever. Whilst there may be glory in battle, there is also huge cost. Be careful not to let glory become the reason for battle. Stories of heroic courage are good for recounting later, but they are not good for the nation when an easier victory can be gained. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, in the practical art of war, the best thing of all is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. To shatter and destroy it is not so good. So too, it is better to capture an entire army, a regiment or company, rather than to destroy it. Lawrence of Arabia led an army in a revolt against the Turkish in the First World War. Huge Turkish guns faced the sea on one side and a vast desert deemed uncrossable was on the other. Expecting no threat from behind, their guns could not be turned around. Lawrence led his men across the desert, attacking and capturing the city, rendering the guns useless. Lawrence's surprise attack defeated the Turkish garrison, most of whom were captured instead of killed, and the city remained intact. Attack your enemy's weaknesses and win the battle whole. Harming people when it is not necessary creates enduring hostility. If you show superiority without fighting, it invokes awe. Lesson number two. To fight and conquer in all your battles is not supreme excellence. Supreme excellence consists in breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Helmut von Moltke the Elder's greatest triumph was the victory over the huge French army in the Franco-Prussian War, won with relatively little bloodshed. Moltke surrounded the fortress the French had retreated to. Calling for reinforcements, he sealed off all possible escape routes. Realising the position was hopeless, Napoleon II raised the white flag and surrendered. All surviving troops were captured. If the enemy sees that you can defeat them with ease, then few will seek simply to fight to a predictable and humiliating death. Lesson number three. The rule is not to besiege walled cities if it can possibly be avoided. The preparation of siege engines and other various implements of war will take up three whole months, and the building of ramparts over the walls will take three months more. At the start of the Boer War in South Africa, the British were not prepared and overconfident. The Boers were well armed and struck first, besieging towns. Despite not being ready, the British defended the town by building fortifications, guns and watchtowers. They then brought in heavy reinforcements and fought back. The Boers had lost their advantage, giving their opponents time to recover and they went on to lose the war. Laying siege to a strongly defended location is hard work will probably take a long time and takes much resource. Your troops are exposed while theirs are hidden. Lesson number four. The general, unable to control his irritation, will launch his men to the assault like swarming ants, and the result that one third of his men are slain, while the town still remains untaken. Such are the perils of a siege. The Japanese general Nogi Marasuki sent his troops to lay siege on the Russian-held Port Arthur. Despite eventually being victorious, Marasuki used human wave attacks on artillery and guns, leading to massive losses. Frustration in the face of an impenetrable enemy is a dangerous companion for any leader, as is any emotion that clouds judgement. Lesson number five. The skillful leader subdues the enemy's troops without any fighting. He captures their cities without laying siege to them. He overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. Napoleon Bonaparte used this strategic knowledge to defeat Austrian general Karl Mack von Liebrich and his troops with minimal losses to his own army. Bonaparte surrounded Mack's forces with an army three times the size Mack was expecting, cutting off any escape routes. Initially refusing to submit, 
Mac's deputies realised the position was futile and started a mutiny. Surrender soon followed. The best way of fighting is to avoid fighting. The best way to win a war is with a greater strategy that outplans and outmanoeuvres the enemy so that they are forced to concede or else suffer a humiliating defeat. Lesson number 6. With his forces intact he will dispute the mastery of the empire, and thus, without losing a man, his triumph will be complete. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. Bonaparte also used bold manoeuvres to defeat his rivals. When trying to capture a crucial but booby trap bridge, two of his officers strolled up to the Austrian guards and said that a truce had been signed. French soldiers soon casually walked and joked over the bridge rather than marching. Once they crossed the bridge, the guards were seized and the bridge was taken undamaged. Fighting wars diminishes forces, which limits the number of wars a commander can wage. If, however, soldiers are not lost and few munitions are used, then the army may march and defeat all in its path with little additional cost. Lesson number 7. Now the general is the protective wall of the state. If the wall is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If the wall is defective, the state will be weak. Prior to the Second World War, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was not prepared to intervene when Austria was invaded and preferred appeasement and making concessions to avoid conflict. Diplomats and politicians pursued this with skill and nerve, like a game of poker, but the enemy wasn't playing poker. Despite Chamberlain claiming to have bought peace, the Germans continued to invade European countries. With Chamberlain's support dwindling, he resigned and a new leader was chosen. If leaders are weak, then their decisions and orders will be weak. Therefore, it is vital for the state to appoint consistently strong leaders. Lesson number 8. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. The Habsburg Duke Leopold II set out to suppress a revolt by the Swiss. Ascending a mountainside with his army, including heavily armoured knights, they found themselves hemmed in on a path blocked by the enemy and became crammed in together in a narrow space. Swiss infantry, hidden on the wooded hillside above, rolled tree trunks and boulders down onto the Habsburg force, knocking men off the cliff into the lake below. Pick the right time and place to fight. An understanding of geography and the situation is useful. Beware of an enemy who have strength in either. Lesson number 9. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. In the Battle of Agincourt, Henry V took on his French opponents, despite having only one quarter of the amount of troops they had. He was victorious in part due to the small narrow field where the battle took place, allowing his archers firing arrows over a much longer distance to be protected by his men armed with stakes on the front line. You will not always have the greatest army, yet you can win. It is important to know the right fighting strategy. Lesson number 10. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit throughout all its ranks. Colonel Joshua Chamberlain was commanding the Union troops in the Battle of Gettysburg. They were outnumbered and unable to hold off another attack. As a desperate measure, Chamberlain had his soldiers charge into the enemy rifles with their bayonets. A lieutenant ran forward, waving his sword and shouting. The other troops followed his courageous example. They shattered two lines of Confederate troops and saved the Union. The constant purpose and knowing the commander's intent keeps an army together with a clear, cohesive focus. Lesson number 11. He will win who has prepared himself and waits to take the enemy unprepared. The British campaign in Gallipoli during the First World War was a huge disaster, partly due to how unprepared the Allies were for the difficult and rugged terrain. They also weren't ready for the strength of the Turkish resistance, who used landmines to great effect. An army will spend very little time actually fighting, but when it is not in combat, it should be preparing. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. If you're prepared but your enemy isn't, then you have a huge advantage. Lesson number 12. He will win who has the military capacity and the sovereign does not interfere in his command. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the great military leaders. As well as ruling on the battlefield, he also successfully engineered a coup to gain political power in France, crowning himself emperor. He owed much of his extraordinary success to the fact he was then not hampered by any other central authority. Rulers know how to rule civilians, generals know how to fight. 
The intent of the ruler is important, but tactics and strategy should be left to those who understand them the best. Lesson number 13. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Fu Qian, the Chinese Emperor, marched with a vast force against rival armies in 383 AD. Despite being warned by advisers not to continue due to having poorly trained soldiers, he said, I have the population of eight provinces at my back. They could dam up the Yangtze River by merely throwing their whips into the stream. What danger have I to fear? His forces were soon decisively beaten in battle and he was forced to make a hasty retreat. Self-belief without self-knowledge is dangerous. Knowing yourself without knowing the opposition is also dangerous. With full knowledge, you can always win. With weak knowledge, you can always fail. Be honest with yourself and know the opponent better than he knows himself. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, the good fighters of old first put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then wait for an opportunity to defeat the enemy. In the rumble in the jungle, Muhammad Ali took on the younger and stronger George Foreman. Ali used his rope-a-dope strategy of protecting himself and not throwing many punches, making Foreman miss and tire. Sensing this, Ali pounced to win back his world title. It may take time to find the right opportunity to win. During the time before victory is available, you may still be defeated. Defence always comes first. Lesson number two. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands, but the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. During the end of the Han Dynasty in China, a general did not go into battle straight away, but camped with his men behind the enemy to act as a deterrent. Meanwhile, he instructed his men to dig trenches around a nearby enemy fortress to deceive the enemy into thinking that they were trying to cut off supplies into their camp. The enemy were fooled and abandoned their position, allowing their camp to be attacked and destroyed. With a good defence you can survive attacks. With a weak defence, even a modest attack could succeed. This also applies to your enemy. Use feints to cause defensive moves that may expose weaknesses. Lesson number three. Thus, the good fighter is able to secure himself against defeat, but cannot make certain of defeating the enemy. When Winston Churchill became the British Prime Minister, his Foreign Secretary wanted to explore a compromise deal with Adolf Hitler to preserve Britain's integrity. Churchill convinced him there wasn't anything to gain by trying to negotiate in such dire circumstances. He did not know the course of the war at that point, but by hanging on, he thought the steps to victory may come to light in the future. Block, deflect or avoid an opponent's attacks and wait to find an opening through which you can defeat them. Two good opponents will circle one another and may fight for a long period before a mistake is made. Lesson number four. Security against defeat implies defensive tactics. Ability to defeat the enemy means taking the offensive. Belisarius reclaimed huge sections of the Roman Empire by repeatedly defending and then attacking the Goths. After convincing the enemy to launch a fruitless attack by defending firmly, he'd then go on the offensive, repossessing the land. To avoid losing, you must be able to defend, but don't spend too long on building a strong defence. To win, you must also be capable to attack. Spend time planning and preparing for effective assaults. Lesson number five. Standing on the defensive indicates insufficient strength. Attacking, a superabundance of strength. Pericles, the ruler of Athens, avoided land battles with Sparta, preferring naval strength in a dragged out war as he calculated Athenian reserves would outlast the Spartans. The Spartans would attack the area around Athens yearly, leading to the Athenians to offer peace to the Spartans who insisted on ruthless terms. It is often easier to defend than attack. Weaker forces will defend more, hoping to see a weakness in their attackers. Lesson number six. The general who is skilled in defence hides in the most secret recesses of the earth. He who is skilled in attack flashes forth from the topmost heights of heaven. 
Thus, on the one hand we have the ability to protect ourselves, on the other, a victory that is complete. The Vietnamese General Zhap recognised the Americans often used artillery and airstrikes, followed by bringing troops in. By surviving the initial airstrikes, Zhap's men could then ambush the American soldiers. He ordered his fighters to stay as close to the Americans as possible, as by having his men nearby, the airstrike would not be called in. By hiding in close proximity to the enemy, his tactics of guerrilla attacks, hand grenade traps, ambushes and snipers were highly effective. You must know your strengths and limitations in defence and attack. Act based on this knowledge. If you are weak in attack, seek a position that is easy to protect. If you are strong in attack, a fast and powerful drive can overcome many defences. Lesson number 7. To see victory only when it is within the knowledge of the common herd is not the peak of excellence. Han Sin was about to attack a superior army when he said to his men, Gentlemen, we are going to annihilate the enemy and shall meet again at dinner. The officers barely took his word seriously and only hesitantly agreed. However, Han Sin had calculated in his head a detailed smart strategy. As he predicted, he was able to inflict a crushing defeat on his opponents. When there is a road paved with gold, without distractions and threats, heading directly to your goal, it takes no skill to follow it. Being able to see the unseen is a skill that can help you in numerous ways. It's easy to succeed in a growing market with plenty of demand. True skill is displayed in tougher times. Lesson number 8. To see the sun and moon is no sign of sharp sight. To hear the noise of thunder is no sign of a quick ear. When Steve Jobs returned to take charge of a near bankrupt Apple, experts advised him to sell the company and license the software. Jobs could see problems within the company that the experts couldn't, and crucially, how to resolve them. After diagnosing the issues, he did the opposite of what they advised, turning the business around. Perceiving what is obvious does not show insight. To perceive what isn't obvious and understand its significance takes a finer skill. Take time to hone your perceptual abilities. Lesson number 9. What the ancients called a clever fighter is one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. Aemilius was sent to Spain to take on barbarians who were at war with the Roman Republic. Defeating the barbarians in two battles with ease, the success was noticeably due to his leadership. By selecting favourable ground and crossing a river, he made winning easy for his men. He returned to Rome leaving the area in peace and without claiming any money for his expedition. A good fighter does not get into difficult fights, nor gets into difficult situations. Using great skill often appears to be done without much effort. This is because it is done with skill and not effort. Lesson number 10. He wins his battles by making no mistakes. Making no mistakes is what establishes the certainty of victory, for it means conquering an enemy that is already defeated. As Hannibal and his Carthaginian army travelled through Italy, Fabius Cunctactor and his Roman soldiers followed him around, hoping Hannibal would make a mistake so they could attack his foragers. Hannibal was a great military strategist and avoided any mistakes, allowing him to destroy farms and villages as he marched on towards Rome. You can lose by making defensive mistakes that allow an attack through. The principle is the same whether in chess, war or business strategy. Lesson number 11. Thus it is that in war the victorious strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won, whereas he who is destined to defeat first fights and afterwards looks for victory. When the Allies broke the German Enigma code in World War II, they could intercept and decrypt military messages sent between German planners. This allowed the Allies to make more informed decisions about when and where to engage the enemy, giving them the ability to stay one step ahead and eventually win the war. Good tacticians see further ahead than others, planning moves and counter moves until certain victory is known. The ability to see possibilities and take your business there is a powerful leadership skill. Lesson number 12. The consummate leader cultivates the moral law and strictly adheres to method and discipline. Thus, it is in his power to control success. During the First World War, King Albert I of Belgium fought alongside his men, sharing the risk of death with them on the front line. He also allowed his 14-year-old son to enlist in the army and fight. At the end of the war, as commander of an army, Albert led the final offensive that liberated his country. 
the king and his family return to Brussels with a hero's welcome. Values and morals start from the very top and filter down. What the leader does, others will copy. Succeeding with regards to morality, method and discipline should lead to triumph. Lesson number 13. Measurement owes its existence to earth. Estimation of quantity to measurement. Calculation to estimation of quantity. Balancing of chances to calculation. And victory to balancing of chances. The Duke of Wellington always performed thorough and detailed preparations. This allowed for his supply routes to be constantly prepared for the requirements of his soldiers. Before the Battle of Waterloo, Wellington studied Napoleon meticulously. He analysed his tactics in great detail. Only once he absolutely knew for sure that the clash was going in his favour did he switch to the offensive. There is no certainty in war. Victory starts with intelligence that allows understanding of risks and opportunities. Project possibilities for each risk and opportunity, then act on the one with the best outcome. Don't base risks and opportunities on opinion. Use data and calculated projection. Improving this will improve your success. Lesson number 14. A victorious army opposed to a routed one is as a pound's weight placed in the scale against a single grain. General George Patton once said, Americans love a winner. Americans will not tolerate a loser. There is an element of truth in this. No one likes to lose and especially not militaries. It has been shown countless times in history that soldiers are willing to tolerate extreme adversity and suffering so long as it ultimately leads to tangible results and victory. Armies that win are superior and have a stronger morale than those which run away. Never underestimate the power of motivation. Leading people to wins, even small ones, will increase morale and lead to more wins. Work hard to rebuild morale after failure. Lesson number 15. The onrush of a conquering force is like the bursting of pent-up waters into a chasm a thousand fathoms deep. The Battle of Stalingrad between Germany and the Soviet Union caused a turning point in the direction of the Second World War. Prior to the conflict, the Germans had invaded and occupied several European countries. The five-month battle and eventual Soviet victory stopped any momentum the Germans had left and gave the Soviets new momentum to eventually drive the enemy out of their country. There was a growth in confidence and increased belief of victory. A fast-moving bullet fired from a gun will do far more damage than if it was thrown by hand. The momentum created by a powerful attack can break through even a strong defence. Momentum can be caused by a string of successes that keeps opponents or competitors on the back foot and may even drive them out of the battleground or market altogether. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, the control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up the numbers. In World War I, the British army grew in size to a peak of nearly four million men. To keep the troops fed, housed, trained and organised, a system of structures and ranks were used. By dividing and subdividing an army into units with officers in command of each, a large force can be controlled and directed regardless of size, as the principles are the same. Size management is also a problem in business. A strict hierarchy can ensure high-level strategy reaches operational management. Lesson number two. Fighting with a large army under your command is no wise different from fighting with a small one. It is merely a question of instituting signs and signals. Pheidippides ran between Marathon and Athens to give news of a military victory. The Romans dedicated entire units to military communication and had a state-run courier service, Cursus Publicus. Modern day communications are now instantaneous, regardless of distance. The important common factor is that instructions reach the front line quickly. Hierarchies help, as long as the information is not blocked or distorted. A well-managed communications network is vital to get information in both directions along the hierarchy quickly and efficiently. Lesson number three. 
that the impact of your army may be like a grindstone dashed against an egg. This is affected by the science of weak points and strong. In the biblical account of David and Goliath, David is victorious against his much stronger opponent by hitting him with a stone in the forehead. A strong item, like a grindstone, can be ruined by something that appears weak, like an egg. What is required is for the physics to be understood. Lesson number four. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth, unending as the flow of rivers and streams. Like the sun and moon, they end, but to begin anew. Like the four seasons, they pass away to return once more. When the Persians tried to invade the Greeks for the second time, they fought in the Battle of Salamis. The Persians had four times as many ships, but in the narrow stretches of water where the battle took place, their huge numbers became a hindrance. The Greeks were able to flank the disorganised Persian ships, resulting in a decisive Greek victory. Fighting is a direct method, challenging soldier against soldier. There are also indirect alternative methods to fighting, attacking from the side or rear being two examples which cause surprise and reaction. By using numerous indirect assaults, you can compound the confusion of your opponent, yielding an easier victory. Lesson number five. There are not more than five musical notes, yet the combinations of these five give rise to more melodies that can ever be heard. In a game of chess, there are only six different types of pieces and 64 spaces on the board. However, the number of different possible positions after four moves each is over 288 billion. In business, online ads can be tweaked endlessly to find the most successful combination of colours, fonts, wording, audience and so on. Combinations begin with a few items that are combined into patterns. These simple items combine into many possibilities that may ultimately succeed or fail. Understand the elements. Design blends and patterns that suit the situation. Lesson number six. In battle, there are not more than two methods of attack, the direct and the indirect. Yet these two in combination give rise to an endless series of manoeuvres. Confederate General Stonewall Jackson used a classic indirect flanking attack to defeat Union General Joseph Hooker on the 2nd of May 1863. By sweeping around the Union while Hooker concerned himself with a direct threat from another general, Jackson's initial assault surprised the Union soldiers so much that Jackson's battle line charged through camps where soldiers were still resting and cooking their meals. Direct and indirect methods can be used in various arrangements to confuse an adversary. A series of indirect feints that cause troops to move can be followed by direct attacks into the gaps that were created. You don't need to always invent new ways of competing to succeed. Find new ways of combining existing methods. They can be just as successful. Lesson number seven. The direct and the indirect lead onto each other in turn. It is like moving in a circle. You never come to an end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? The overconfidence and lack of preparation led to the disastrous defeat of the English, led by Edward II, to the Scots, led by Robert the Bruce, at the Battle of Bannockburn. Victory disease refers to when complacency or arrogance brought on by victory causes an encounter to end in disaster for a leader and his forces. A leader may employ strategies which were previously effective, but prove disastrous against a new or smarter enemy. As yin and yang, each entity creates its opposite. Attacking the enemy creates a counterattack. Design your battles in terms of ebbs and flows, indirect and direct, defence and attack. Winning can lead to losing by arrogance leading to sloppiness. Losing can lead to winning by turning sorrow into determination. Lesson number eight. The onset of troops is like the rush of a torrent, which will even roll stones along in its course. After Scotland was conquered in 1296, an uprising began the following year when William Wallace assassinated an English sheriff. This initial act led to a revolt spreading through Scotland. The uprising gained momentum as men joined Wallace to carry out raids, and separate rebellions occurred elsewhere, liberating large parts of the country. Water flows fast over and under stones, rolling them onwards. When warriors flow fast, they will bowl over anything in their way. Flow occurs when a rapid sequence of blows leaves the enemy no time to recover or resist, before the next attack arrives. 
A company can flow by releasing a superb new product. Then, even before competitors bring out a response, they advance again with another, even better replacement. Lesson number 9. The quality of decision is like the well-timed swoop of a falcon, which enables it to strike and destroy its victim. When HMS Victory slowly went into action at the Battle of Trafalgar, she was exposed to a storm of shot and shell for several minutes before replying with a single gun. Admiral Lord Nelson calmly waited until he was within close range, then wrecked havoc on the enemy's nearest ships. Like a falcon, harness self-restraint to keep from swooping on your target until the right moment. Timing is critical in many situations. The same effort will have very different effects at different times. Lesson number 10. Energy may be likened to the bending of a crossbow, decision to the releasing of a trigger. Minutemen were settlers who organised themselves forming militia groups. They trained themselves in weapons, strategy and tactics during the American War of Independence. Their name came from their capacity to be ready at a minute's notice, providing highly mobile, rapidly deployed units. When you bend a bow, it has potential but static energy. When letting go of the bow, it releases dynamic and kinetic energy. The bent bow represents the readiness of your fighters. The release of the bow leads quickly to them flowing rapidly over the enemy. Your decision when to release the arrow determines whether it hits or misses its target. Lesson number 11. Amid the turmoil and tumult of battle, there may be seeming disorder and yet no real disorder at all. Amid confusion and chaos, your array may be without head or tail, yet it will be proof against defeat. At the Battle of the Bulge, German armoured divisions secretly assembled near the German border, smashed through American infantry divisions in a Belgian forest. Large tanks rolled down wooded roads the Allies considered unfavourable to armoured warfare, so they were barely defended. Despite many believing the enemy was nearly defeated, the Americans experienced the power of a German blitzkrieg, a coordinated manoeuvre involving coordination between air and land forces. True chaos occurs when there is a loss of control. Apparent chaos occurs where patterns cannot be distinguished. Complex sequences of quick movement mean patterns are hard to detect. Control amidst disorder comes with skill. This comes from learning, training and preparation. Lesson number 12. Simulated disorder postulates perfect discipline. Simulated fear postulates courage. Simulated weakness postulates strength. In the Battle of Hastings, the Anglo-Saxon force consisted of many working men called up to form an army for their kings. During the combat, the Normans pretended to run away then turned and cut down the Saxons when the inexperienced men chased them. You display control if you act in an unvarying way. To show disorder, each person must be acting differently. If your rival thinks you have lost control, they will make mistakes. Fear leads to disorder, but the risk in showing fear is that it may spur your opposition on. To put yourself at a disadvantage takes bravery, but by misleading the enemy in this way, you can lead them into mistakes. Lesson number 13. Thus one who is skillful at keeping the enemy on the move maintains deceitful appearances, according to which the enemy will act. He sacrifices something that the enemy may snatch at it. During his conquest of Gaul, Julius Caesar used deception in his tactics to achieve the crossing of a river. The enemy shadowed Caesar's force from the opposite side of the river, challenging any attempted crossing. Camping in a wood one night, when leaving the next day, Caesar left a third of his army behind, dividing the remaining men to appear at full strength. Once safe to proceed, the hidden army rebuilt a damaged crossing and established a bridge. Wars can be won with little fighting using the skill of deceit, if it is highly developed. Business can also be won using this same method. Lesson number 14. By holding out baits, he keeps him on the march. Then with a body of picked men, he lies in wait for him. In 1796, a baron commanding Austrian forces attempted to remove the French from Verona. However, he was drawn forward by Napoleon and in doing so exposed his forces flank, letting Bonaparte surround and then defeat him. There are many forms of deceit, including baiting and ambushes. 
lure the enemy into traps to increase the chance of achieving an easy win. Lesson number 15. The clever combatant looks to the effect of combined energy and does not require too much from individuals. Hence his ability to pick out the right men and utilise combined energy. The Mongol armies used several different tactics which, when combined, made them extremely successful in battle. They used units that would charge the enemy and then retreat, trying to draw the enemy onto more favourable terrain. The Mongol leaders used trickery by spreading rumours about the size of their armies. They also tried to deceive their opponents visually by keeping several spare horses in their cavalry mounted with dummies made of straw. On the battlefield, the Mongols used many other tactics to deceive the enemy, including lighting fires to act as a smokescreen and enticing enemies into traps. Using numerous tactical methods so that their potential is multiplied causes the enemy to be quickly overwhelmed. Combined energy provides synergy, where the effect is greater than if the various tactics were used independently. Understand the power both of the army as a whole and of talented individuals and how these are best combined. This will ensure success. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, whoever is first in the field and awaits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. Whoever is second in the field and has to hasten to battle will arrive exhausted. Francis Drake led a preemptive strike against Spanish naval ships that were still assembling with an aim to invade England. Drake's preparations and actions were approved by the Queen, and his attack resulted in a hundred ships being destroyed or captured, causing the Spanish Armada's attack to be crucially delayed for a year. The following year, the English fleet defeated the Armada with Drake playing an instrumental role. Start something early to stand a better chance of success. Arrive at a battlefield or in a business market first. You have time to settle, survey the ground, plan ahead and pick your tactics. You can also attack opponents or competitors as they arrive to prevent them from settling and building a presence or market share. Lesson number two. Therefore, the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed on him. Union Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and his men faced an attack from the Confederates. Chamberlain knew that his soldiers did not have enough ammunition to resist the attack, so he ordered his men to fix bayonets to their guns and charge the Confederate troops. The charge surprised the attackers, taking the initiative away from them and causing them to retreat in confusion. Take initiatives to lead the game. When you act first, the other side has to respond. In this way, you can keep them constantly on the back foot. To be effective, fight on your own terms or not at all. Lesson number three. By holding out advantages to him, he can cause the enemy to approach of his own accord. Or, by inflicting damage, he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. Before the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon tried to lure his opponent out by appearing to be weak and seeking to negotiate peace. Seeing this and being anxious for revenge, Tsar Alexander I decided to immediately lead the Allies into battle. Napoleon drew the opposing forces forward to expose their weak centre and he went on to defeat them. When pressed, your opponent will grab at what appear as opportunities to gain advantage and take the lead. Their desperation will make them less thoughtful and they won't realise the traps that you set until it is too late. Lesson number four. If the enemy is taking his ease, he can harass him. If well supplied with food, he can starve him out. If quietly encamped, he can force him to move. In the First and Second World Wars, German U-boats were used primarily to target merchant ships that sailed in a convoy, bringing supplies to the United Kingdom from overseas. Initially, the U-boats were extremely effective, causing Winston Churchill to remark, The only thing that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. When the opposition seems comfortable, find ways to remove their comfort. Sustain their tension to prevent them preparing and exhaust them before they fight. Lesson number five. An army may march great distances without distress if it marches through country where the enemy is not. 
During the French invasion of Russia in 1812, Napoleon's large force marched slowly through Western Russia, trying to bring their opponents to battle. They initially met little resistance and moved quickly across the territory. Later, Cossacks burnt villages and crops to stop the French living off the land as they progressed. A lack of alternative supplies led to starvation and slow progress for Napoleon's men. When travelling through occupied territory, you must be continually scouting around and in a state of constant readiness. When there is nothing to fear, you can move at speed without caution. Lesson number 6. You can be sure of succeeding in your attacks if you only attack places which are undefended. You can ensure the safety of your defence if you only hold positions that cannot be attacked. When the Vikings sailed over to Britain, they raided various sites. In particular, they focused on largely undefended religious buildings that housed monks, which provided minimal resistance. Where possible, attack areas which are unguarded. If all places are defended, select points to attack where defences are weakest. Ensure you have no weak points of your own that offer your foe an easy way in. Lesson number 7. O divine art of subtlety and secrecy, through you we learn to be invisible, through you inaudible, and hence we can hold the enemy's fate in our hands. Camouflage has been used since the Gaelic Wars, when Julius Caesar sent ships to the coast of Britain. These scouting ships were sent to gather intelligence and were painted in Venetian blue, which was a similar colour to that of the sea. The sailors also wore the same colours to increase the effect of the visual deception. Use camouflage and secrecy to cover your locations and intent. It will allow you to act at will, even from within enemy ground, as an opponent without form or sound is very difficult to attack. Lesson number 8. If we wish to fight, the enemy can be forced to an engagement, even though he be sheltered behind a high rampart and a deep ditch. All we need to do is attack some other place that he will be obliged to relieve. Napoleon Bonaparte was an expert at the turning movement. This military manoeuvre was an indirect approach that attempted to swing around the enemy which then threatened their supply lines. Often this forced the enemy to abandon their strong position, otherwise they risked being cut off and surrounded. Get an enemy out of their current position by forcing them to come to the defence of another place. Instead of laying siege, attack alternative targets. When the enemy leaves their stronghold to help others, then you can ambush them. Lesson number 9. If we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us even though the lines of our encampment be merely traced out on the ground. All we need to do is to throw something odd and unaccountable in his way. On D-Day during the Allied invasion of Normandy, German High Command kept back numerous divisions on reserve instead of using them against weak Allied beachheads. By keeping General Patton out of the Normandy invasion force, the Germans were confused. Patton was used to command a fictional army complete with landing craft and inflatable tanks elsewhere, causing the Germans to believe the Normandy invasion was a diversion, rather than the real assault. This allowed the beachheads to be established. An army that advances is cautious in case of trickery and traps. You can deceive such an army by implying deception. This bluff will halt them temporarily, until the suspected issue is resolved. Lesson number 10. The spot where we intend to fight must not be made known, for then the enemy will have to prepare against a possible attack at several different points, and his forces being thus distributed in many directions, the numbers we shall have to face at any given point will be proportionately few. When discussing the real reason behind General Ulysses S. Grant's numerous victories, Philip Sheridan, a Union general, said, while his opponents were kept fully employed wondering what he was going to do, he was thinking most of what he was going to do himself. When you identify the enemy's weaker points, even greater secrecy is needed so that they don't learn your plans and bolster the defence at the point you'll attack. Lesson number 11. For should the enemy strengthen his front, he will weaken his rear. Should he strengthen his rear, he will weaken his front. Should he strengthen his left, he will weaken his right. Should he strengthen his right, he will weaken his left. If he sends reinforcements everywhere, he will everywhere be weak. The King of Prussia, Frederick the Great, set out the following principles to his generals. A defensive war is apt to betray us into too frequent detachment. 
Those generals who have had but little experience attempt to protect every point, while those who are better acquainted with their profession, having only the capital object in view, guard against a decisive blow, and acquiesce in small misfortunes to avoid greater. To strengthen a part requires taking troops from elsewhere, weakening another part. If a force is evenly spread on all parts, it is easy for the enemy to produce a force greater in strength at a certain point, allowing them to penetrate your defence. Know how to spread your concentration of resources. This may mean allowing the opponent smaller wins in order for you to achieve a larger victory. Lesson number 12. Knowing the place and the time of the coming battle, we may concentrate from the greatest distances in order to fight. Gerpard Liebrich von Blücher's intervention with his Prussian army in the Battle of Waterloo was a masterly employment of a strategy that coordinated his forces with the Duke of Wellington's men. At a critical moment, Blücher provided assistance and diverted Napoleon's vital reinforcements, preventing a British defeat and overwhelming Bonaparte's forces. Know when and where your battles will be, so you have time to bring in more resources to the battlefield. Timing is critical. A well-timed arrival of reinforcements can turn your fortune around. Lesson number 13. Though according to my estimate their soldiers exceed our own in number, that shall advantage them nothing in the matter of victory. I say then that victory can be achieved. In 1700, Peter the Great and his Russian army encircled a city belonging to the Swedish Empire. The Russian forces outnumbered the Swedes by about 4 to 1, but a blizzard stopped both armies from moving. Seeing the wind change direction, Swedish King Charles XII realised the snow was obscuring Russian vision, and he marched forward undetected with his troops, killing or capturing the whole Russian army around the city. Having more resources and assets is an advantage, but it is not the only way to gain an advantage. Use superior strategy and tactics to enable a far smaller force to win. Lesson number 14. Carefully compare the opposing army with your own, so that you may know where strength is superabundant and where it is deficient. The Battle of Crecy was a victory for England against France, despite having a smaller army on the battlefield. The use of longbows by the English, which were quicker to fire with a longer range than the French crossbows, was a significant factor to the triumph. Compare yourself with your opponent in all skill sets, and understand who is superior in each and to what extent. Take advantage in the places where you are superior. Express caution in the areas where you are weaker. Lesson number 15. In making tactical dispositions, the highest pitch you can attain is to conceal them. Conceal your dispositions and you will be safe from the prying eyes of the subtlest spies, from the machinations of the wisest brains. Many of the most successful Roman generals kept their strategies as secret as possible. This not only provided an upper hand against enemies that were unaware of their plans, but it also protected their own soldiers too. In battle, spying and intelligence is a subtle but important activity. The opponent may be able to infiltrate into your people, so the more important your plans, the more secret you must keep them, and for as long as possible. Know who you can trust. Lesson number 16. All men can see the tactics whereby I conquer, but what none can see is the strategy out of which victory has evolved. When Richard the Lionheart faced the army of Saladin, his tactics involved forming a defensive position with his back to a river. There he waited despite being under constant missile attack. Saladin could see the tactic, but was unaware Richard's strategy was to wait for him to get impatient. Saladin thought Richard and his crusaders wouldn't move for days, so he ordered his men off their horses to better fire their missiles. When he saw this, Richard ordered his heavy cavalry to charge, flattening the enemy and winning the battle. Tactics are actions that are part of an overall strategy. Understand the strategy and you may be able to predict probable tactics. Good tactics do not give away the strategy, they will surprise the enemy or cause them to believe you are using an altogether different strategy. Lesson number 17. Do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. The Thirty Years' War in Western Europe saw many military developments take place during its time. Prior to the war, 
Many armies took part in attacks that were unsustained, leaving time for soldiers to pillage. That approach proved unsuccessful in this war, as successful attacks were continual and offensive tactics became more common. A fast offensive campaign gave the enemy little time to prepare its defences. It is tempting to repeat using a method you are successful with, but success often comes from the surprise created. Lightning is very unlikely to strike twice. Innovation is critical, especially when it comes to business. Keep opponents guessing by including changing direction in your strategic innovation. Lesson number 18. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Mahatma Gandhi knew when he was campaigning politically for Indian independence that by taking on the British Empire directly with violent protests, many people would be massacred. Instead, he encouraged non-cooperation with British rule. Boycotts of goods and a refusal to pay taxes led to Britain weakening its stance and beginning negotiation of Indian independence. Fighting a strong opponent directly is foolish and a good way of losing resources. Direct conflict is not the only way to win, there are many alternatives. Lesson number 19. Just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. The Spartan army consisted of warriors that were known for their bravery, skill and proficiency. With Spartan warriors being picked before birth and beginning training as boys, their lifestyle meant individual as well as overall group tactics were honed to perfection and they could adapt to many different conditions or situations. Water is fluid and doesn't have a fixed shape like a rock. It can wear down a rock over time or roll it out of the way. Gain success by not just a grand strategy, but also by adapting to situations as they occur. Lesson number 20. He who can modify his tactics in relation to his opponent and thereby succeed in winning may be called a heaven-born captain. The trench warfare that took place in World War I had multiple changes in tactics over the years it took place. As the conditions were very poor, men were put on a rotating schedule in the trenches. As the intensity of the war changed, so did the routines to match it. A year into the war, Allied tactics were modified again. They now planned artillery barrages to destroy the enemy's barbed wire and fixed defences. These attacks were closely monitored and carefully controlled. Be sure to sense even the slightest change in your environment and respond as necessary, whilst always remembering your ultimate goal. Do not react purely based on the present, but try to think about your vision further down the line and how to cope with all the possibilities. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, in war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign. Subutai was Genghis Khan's most astute and brilliant general. His great discipline and intelligence when carrying out his ruler's orders allowed him to execute them successfully and help the Mongols create one of the largest empires in history. Set goals and aspirations that are achievable. Allow others to use their expertise to advance the strategy to achieve your intended objectives. Lesson number two. Having collected an army and concentrated his forces, he must blend and harmonize the different elements thereof before pitching his camp. Miltiades, the Athenian general, used innovative tactics at the Battle of Marathon to defeat the Persians, despite his men being outnumbered. Miltiades convinced his war ruler that to defeat their opponent, they needed to change from the traditional tactics of spreading their hoplite soldiers evenly across the battlefield and instead moved them to the flanks to protect against a strong Persian cavalry. This move helped win the battle for the Greeks. When deciding where to position your best people, there is no magic formula. The choice can be critical, but is dependent on your strategy and the manoeuvres you intend to make. Lesson number three. After that comes tactical manoeuvring, than which there is nothing more difficult. The difficulty of tactical manoeuvring consists in turning the devious into the direct, and misfortune into gain. Hannibal and Napoleon were two of the most ruthless generals of their respective eras. They both made the treacherous journey of crossing the Alps, 2,000 years apart. 
Despite being extremely difficult ground to travel across with obvious natural obstacles, both generals used swiftness of movement to turn these difficulties into an advantage. Hannibal bypassed Roman naval ships to attack in Italy directly, while Napoleon took the shortest route to surprise and drive back the Austrian army. Once your plans are in place, the next step is to get them in motion. Strong execution is very important. Strategy is worthless if you can't do what you planned. Lesson number four. Maneuvering with an army is advantageous, with an undisciplined multitude most dangerous. Alexander the Great was given an already well-trained army from his father, but he trained them even further. He dressed in the same way as his soldiers to increase their loyalty to him. As well as leading from the front in battle, he'd walk through the camp and stop to talk to his men, which increased their motivation. He was also ruthless in punishing those soldiers who betrayed him, executing dissenters. His disciplined force travelled far and wide, with speed and mobility when needed. Often you have to move quickly to take advantage of an opportunity. There may be little time for planning and training. You must see the need and move quickly. This is why preparation and practice is so important. There is no time on the day. Lesson number five. An army without its baggage train is lost. Without provisions, it is lost. Without bases of supply, it is lost. After the death of Alexander the Great, two of his successors battled over his empire. In the Battle of Gabine, Antigonus captured Eumenes' baggage train, which contained supplies and stolen goods from nearly four decades of warfare. This directly led to the defeat of Eumenes, who was turned over by his own men in exchange for the return of the captured baggage train. An army marches on its stomach. Food and other supplies keep troops alive, motivated and strong. You may still perform well without supplies for a short period of time, but you cannot hold out forever. Ensure adequate resources are in place. Lesson number six. We cannot enter into alliances until we are acquainted with the designs of our neighbours. England and Portugal have enjoyed a partnership for hundreds of years, dating back to the Middle Ages. Both countries were aware of the benefits for each other. For Portugal, English aid helped them repel potential invaders, and for the English, it provided them with a foothold in mainland Europe. It is the oldest alliance still in force. When offered a partnership, ask what is in it for them and what do they really seek. When their desires and intent are known, you can determine how much you trust them and whether to become an ally. Lesson number seven. We are not fit to lead an army on the march unless we are familiar with the face of the country, its mountains and forests, its pitfalls and precipices, its marshes and swamps. Emperor Nicephorus I of the Byzantine Empire ignored an offer of peace from the leader of Bulgaria, Khan Krum, and instead marched and pillaged the capital with 80,000 men. The looting was so brutal and lengthy, it gave the Bulgarian army time to block the passes in the Balkan mountains. By failing to scout the passes after the ransacking, Nicephorus and his army marched into the mountains, became trapped, and were killed. Crum had Nicephorus's skull encased in silver and made into a drinking cup. Understand well the land in front and any obstacles to come. By knowing anything that lies ahead, you will be prepared as well as you can be. Lesson number eight. We shall be unable to turn natural advantage to account unless we make use of local guides. In the Battle of Thermopylae, despite having vastly inferior numbers, the Greeks successfully blocked the only road the Persian army could pass for two days. After the second day, a local Greek resident betrayed his fellow men by revealing that a small path led behind the Greek lines. Xerxes, the Persian ruler, sent his troops over the mountain path that evening so that they could attack the Greeks from the rear and leave them surrounded, which led to the Greeks being defeated. Research can only tell you so much. Local experts will know much more than you possibly can through experience, so make use of them. Seek out and learn from those that understand things to a depth that you can't. Lesson number nine. Whether to concentrate or to divide your troops must be decided by circumstances. During the First World War, the Central Powers were unable to match the Allies in terms of number of fighter aircraft. To overcome this, instead of deploying their fighters evenly across the fronts, the Germans concentrated their fighters into large mobile formations called Jagdschwader. One of these formations was known as the Flying Circus due to the aircraft's bright colours and their method of being transferred from one area of conflict to another, 
improvising and setting up camp wherever they went, much like a circus. These rapidly moving units allowed the Germans to achieve air supremacy by creating a local superiority in numbers. Do not blindly apply rules of thumb, as this will often lead to failure. Each decision has many complicating factors and must be carefully considered. Lesson number 10. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night, and when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. The Neo-Babylonian Empire fell to the King of Persia, Cyrus the Great, in the Battle of Opis. The only way into the city of Babylon was through one of the gates or through the Euphrates River, as the city walls were considered impenetrable. Metal grates installed underwater allowed the river to flow through the city walls while stopping invaders. The Persians formulated a secret plan to enter Babylon via the Euphrates River. During a Babylonian national feast, Cyrus's troops redirected the river upstream, which allowed soldiers to enter the city through the lowered water. The Persian army then overran the outer areas of the city, while the majority of its citizens were in the city centre, unaware of any attack. Keep your plans secret and strictly on a need-to-know basis. When attacking, use speed and move fast to build unstoppable momentum. Lesson number 11. When you plunder a countryside, let the spoil be divided amongst your men. When you capture new territory, cut it up into allotments for the benefit of the soldiery. After his successful invasion of England, William the Conqueror carried out some land management. Approximately 25% of available land was acquired for himself, and 25% went to the church, who had given the invasion their blessing from Rome. The remaining land was divided between his dozen or so loyal and trusted servants. Giving land as a reward had a double purpose. It motivated his servants with a future reward, and it meant that through them he was still in control of the land due to their loyalty. Remember to reward people for the efforts that they make. It shows that you care about them and that you are fair and even-handed. The more motivated they are, the harder they will fight for you. Lesson number 12. Gongs and drums, banners and flags are means whereby the ears and eyes of the host may be focused on one particular point. In ancient China, there was extensive usage of flags for communication in warfare. Different positions were used to indicate enemy movements. Commands were transmitted through horns, drums, gongs, bells and whistles. The drums were also used to influence enemy and friendly morale. In order for people to understand your communication, you must broadcast using a method that people can grasp. Communication is not what is transmitted, but what people understand. Use loud and visible communications in environments where there are many distractions. Lesson number 13. The host thus forming a single united body is it impossible either for the brave to advance alone, or for the cowardly to retreat alone? This is the art of handling large masses of men. The American poet and war correspondent Stephen Crane spoke of a mysterious fraternity born out of smoke and danger of death. He was referring to the special type of friendship and ties developed when facing life and death situations in battle. The obligations to your fellow soldiers is seen as one of the most powerful reasons to fight. This bond with the men standing beside you helps prevent troops from fleeing. Camaraderie is therefore vital in uniting fighters in war. Leadership is critical to move the men in the intended direction. When a group of people come together, they behave differently. The herd mentality drives them to act in the same way as those around them. A large group can therefore be moved by a small group within. This is the essence of leadership. Lesson number 14. A whole army may be robbed of its spirit. A commander-in-chief may be robbed of his presence of mind. A few weeks after becoming Prime Minister, Winston Churchill gave a speech following the Dunkirk evacuation. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. It was an exhilarating declaration to the nation to pick itself up and start the struggle all over again. The speech strengthened Britain's resolve at a vital time in history. An army's spirit provides the motivation and energy to engage in combat. Low spirits increase bad decisions. By being positive and energised, 
you can make a huge difference to your workforce as a spirited leader. Lesson number 15. Now a soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning. By noonday it has begun to flag, and in the evening his mind is bent only on returning to camp. When the Carthaginians took on the Roman Republic in the Battle of the Trebia, the Roman soldiers were ordered to march forward and wade through ice cold water, despite not even having their morning meal. When they got across the river, they could hardly hold their weapons. Hannibal on the other hand was prepared. His men were fed and warmed from their campfires with their weapons ready. Ensure you have adequate rest and food as it improves your mood. Even one day of inaction can reduce spirit and make you listless and lethargic. Lesson number 16. A clever general, therefore, avoids an army when its spirit is keen, but attacks it when it is sluggish and inclined to return. This is the art of studying moods. Between December 1941 and February 1942, several Japanese successes across Southeast Asia reduced the morale of British soldiers defending Singapore. Spirits were so low that when the Japanese eventually attacked, they quickly surrendered. After the war was over, a Japanese commander said that his attack was a bluff and that his men were extremely low on water and ammunition. He admitted that if the British defenders had held for one more week, which was feasible, his attack would have failed. Engage your opponent when their spirit is low and yours is high. It will give you a significant advantage. Lesson number 17. To refrain from intercepting an enemy whose banners are in perfect order, to refrain from attacking an army drawn up in calm and confident array, this is the art of studying circumstances. Napoleon in 1812 and the Germans in 1941 both tried to invade Russia. The Russians refrained from attacking in both cases and sacrificed vast expanses of their land until the environmental conditions wore their enemies out. The American Continental Army fought a long, drawn-out campaign in the War of Independence. This tactic helped to defeat the British, who were also concerned with the great military threat from France. Good timing is required when striking at the enemy. Keep cool and calm, it will let you wait for the right moment. Lose your cool first and as a consequence, you may lose the fight. Lesson number 18. It is a military axiom not to advance uphill against the enemy, nor to oppose him when he comes downhill. Historically, fighting from an elevated position has numerous advantages. Holding the high ground provides a wide field of view, which enables observation of the surrounding area. This makes it easier to provide early warning about enemy troops. Troops fighting uphill will move more slowly and tire quicker than the enemy fighting downhill. Also, elevated soldiers have greater range with weapons such as rocks, arrows and grenades. Well-trained archers that were positioned on top of a hill at the Battle of Agincourt illustrated this point and helped England to beat the French. Among humans, height is often seen as a symbol of status. Taller people are statistically more likely to be in senior business positions. The fact that height is used as a metaphor for superiority provides a subtle psychological edge and the effect could affect motivation in a battle. Lesson number 19. Do not pursue an enemy who simulates flight. Do not attack soldiers whose temper is keen. Lucius Cornelius Scipio captured several towns in the island of Sardinia by landing strong units of soldiers at night. He told them to stay in hiding until he drew near to land with his own ships. As the enemy left their towns to come and meet the ships, Scipio pretended to flee, leading them on a long chase. Meanwhile, his hidden troops were ordered to attack the towns that had been abandoned by their inhabitants. If your opponent runs away or backs down unexpectedly, beware of chasing them as they may well be leading you into a trap. Lesson number 20. When you surround an army, leave an outlet free. Do not press a desperate foe too hard. Such is the art of warfare. During their invasion of Europe, the Mongol Empire took on the Kingdom of Hungary. After the Mongols attacked one camp, demoralised Hungarian soldiers fled. They tried to escape through a gap which the Mongols had left open deliberately. The Mongols believed that fleeing soldiers can be killed more easily than those who are forced to fight to the death with their backs against the wall. If an enemy is cornered, they must fight for their lives. By forcing them to go down in a blaze of glory, they will take more of your soldiers or resources than you might otherwise have used. 
needlessly slaughtering an army will gain you hostility from their family and fellow citizens. It will increase the chance of them arising to take revenge. Allowing a graceful retreat in the direction you choose is often a better option. After you show your superiority, you will be able to negotiate a favourable peace. Lesson number one. When in difficult country, do not encamp. In country where high roads intersect, join hands with your allies. Do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. In hemmed in situations, you must resort to stratagem. In desperate position, you must fight. A Roman consul once led his army into the enemy territory of Liguria. As soon as he had established a camp, some ambassadors came to see him with an offer of peace. In reality, these men were spies, and after they agreed to surrender, instead the Ligurians returned a few days later in great number, attacking every gate of the Roman camp at once. Do not stay in a dangerous place for too long. If you are in a particularly vulnerable position, it gives the enemy a greater opportunity to find and attack you. In business, being stagnant allows competitors to push you out. Lesson number two. There are roads which must not be followed armies which must not be attacked, towns which must not be besieged, positions which must not be contested, commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. The French Marshal General of the 17th century, Turenne, was considered by Napoleon as one of warfare's great captains. He once said, It is a great mistake to waste men in taking a town, when the same expenditure of soldiers will gain a province. Don't fight battles you can't win. As well as missing out on victory, you will also lose the opportunity to succeed elsewhere. Show patience until a better opportunity can be created or emerges. It may take more courage, but can prevent catastrophes. Lesson number three. The general who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany variation of tactics knows how to handle his troops. The Duke of Wellington was a master tactician who avoided high risk moves and dramatic victories. He knew his tactics intimately and was aware when to use them and just as importantly when not to use them. Wellington cared about his men and conserved his troops. After several victorious battles against the French, he refused to pursue the remainder of the French forces over rough terrain as he knew there would be a cost to his own army. Knowing tactics and techniques is not enough. You need to know when to use them. Skill is required to match the tactics to the situation and how to combine them. In business, a great strategy is useless if you can't translate it into a solid but flexible execution. Lesson number four. So, the student of war who is unversed in the art of war of varying his plans, even though he be acquainted with the five advantages, will fail to make the best use of his men. General Patton's last assignment in the US Army was to compile a history of the Second World War in Europe. He explained to a journalist the role was right down my alley because I have been a student of war since I was about seven years old. His study of military history was central to his actions on the battlefield earlier in his career. He wrote several articles on warfare using historical examples to answer current problems. There are two ways to learn tactics, from personal experience or from history. The best leaders are accomplished practitioners and ongoing students. This allows you to learn what will work even before you've used it. Lesson number five. Hence, in the wise leader's plans, considerations of advantage and of disadvantage will be blended together. In the American War of Independence, America was unfamiliar territory for the British. Its large size made it difficult to conquer and hold territory, which proved a disadvantage for them and an advantage for their local opponents. Conversely, the British had an advantage in that they outnumbered the Americans in most battles. Superiority is a two-sided coin. When you have the advantage, the other side is disadvantaged, and vice versa. At any one time, you can have both advantage and disadvantage. Your plans and actions need to take them both into account. Lesson number six. If, in the midst of difficulties, we are always ready to seize an advantage, we may extricate ourselves from misfortune. In 1415, 
Henry V's English army marched across northern France and was confronted by a larger French force under Charles d'Albret. The French only needed to block the route to English-held territory as the English were low on food and were suffering from the cold weather. However, when Henry's men advanced shouting and flying flags, d'Albret took it as an insult and a challenge. He decided to attack and lead his men across a field of mud in the heavy rain. The French soldiers slipped and fell, making themselves sitting targets for archers. Thousands of Frenchmen were killed or taken prisoner, while the English lost only a few men. Ahead of you lies advantage and disadvantage, depending on the path you take. Pay close attention to these and you'll have the chance to snatch the moments of advantage. Businesses go through times of advantage and disadvantage, but don't assume these times will continue. Use your knowledge to plan ahead. Lesson number seven. The art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him. Not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made opposition unassailable. Constantine the Great founded the city of Constantinople, which became the capital of the Roman Empire. It was built with huge, complicated defences, which made it impenetrable to an attack for over 900 years from many different people. Giant stone walls surrounded the city, and over the years they were built upon to create a double and then triple wall fortification. The walls protected the city from being besieged by land or sea, with hundreds of manned towers able to fight off invaders. You can win any battle as long as you always defend successfully. Always being ready to take on opponents is the best strategy to help achieve this. Lesson number eight. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. A. Recklessness, which leads to destruction. Julius Caesar's ambition was so compulsive that it led to his self-destruction. He gambled recklessly when it came to politics and his ruthless ambition led to him installing himself as dictator. After refusing to step down, members of the Senate grew angry and fearful of his constant demands for greater power and they assassinated him. Avoid recklessness by not reacting or making decisions based on dangerous emotions such as anger. Instead, use facts and knowledge. B. Cowardice, which leads to capture. The Roman Emperor Commodus installed a former slave, Cleander, as a senior official and commander. After a famine had occurred, a mob of people blamed Cleander for the food shortage. He went to Commodus for protection, but the Emperor was a coward and became terrified. Instead, Commodus had Cleander killed. The Emperor's behaviour led to him being assassinated himself two years later. In a battle, you have to make decisions. If you decide not to fight, even though it is necessary, you will not only lose the war, but do so in a shameful and dishonourable way. C. A hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher, said that anger was a sign of weakness. Another emperor, Valentinian I, demonstrated this, and it ended up costing him his life. Some envoys from a tribe in conflict with the Roman Empire met with Valentinian. They insisted that the dispute was caused by the Romans building forts on their land. Their attitude incensed Valentinian, who suffered a burst blood vessel while shouting at them, causing his death. A person who can be provoked with ease can be defeated with ease by a cunning foe. D. A delicacy of honour, which is sensitive to shame. Saladin lay siege to a crusader fortress while King Guy of Jerusalem assembled a large crusader army nearby. Faced with the opportunity of raiding Saladin's supply lines while he was preoccupied, Guy said it was a cowardly way to fight and beneath his dignity as a king. Instead, he marched across the desert directly to Saladin despite not having access to fresh water. Saladin attacked the weakened crusaders, defeating almost their entire army. A sense of honour is mainly a good quality, but be careful if the thought of shame leads to losing actions, such as entering into an unwinnable contest. E. Over solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. In the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal was prepared to sacrifice his weakest troops to achieve victory. The Romans put heavy soldiers in the middle of their line to break Hannibal's front line. Aware of this, Hannibal put his light soldiers in the middle to move away quickly from the oncoming Romans. As the weaker troops retreated, 
the Romans were lured in and became surrounded by the stronger flanks. Care for your workforce, but don't take it to excess. Do not let your concern for their well-being lead to unwise strategic decisions. Lesson number 9. When an army is overthrown and its leader slain, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Let them be a subject of meditation. By finding any of these five faults in a potential opponent, a commander can devise a deception to take advantage of it. In the Battle of Cowpens, American General Morgan made his men partially retreat, giving the impression of a full withdrawal. The reckless British Colonel Tarleton saw this and charged at the American line. Morgan had anticipated this, and his men were well prepared to first defend and then overwhelm the British forces. Avoid the five common faults highlighted and you will avoid many of the problems that plague leaders and their men. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, We come now to the question of encamping the army and observing signs of the enemy. Pass quickly over mountains and keep in the neighbourhood of valleys. Al Capone chose not to hide from the media and made many public appearances rather than hiding in the criminal underworld. His celebrity status made him a high visibility target for prosecutors, which eventually led to his arrest and imprisonment. Avoid high places where you can be trapped and spotted from multiple other locations. Valleys offer more space in which to manoeuvre. Lesson number two. After crossing a river, you should get far away from it. In the Battle of Tettenhall, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms took on the Vikings who had travelled up a river to take revenge for an earlier attack. The river took the Vikings deep into the Anglo-Saxon heartland. They ravaged the land, but they were later caught and stopped from returning. Trapped in hostile territory led to the death of some Viking kings and thousands of their men. Avoid any boundaries that are difficult to cross easily, as it is easy to become hemmed in. Use boundaries for defensive purposes if rivals struggle to cross them. Lesson number three. If you are careful of your men and camp on hard ground, the army will be free from disease of every kind, and this will spell victory. Henry V invaded France with thousands of troops. Within a few days he had captured a French port, but a combination of bad weather and poor conditions led to the loss of around a third of his men to dysentery. Ensure the environment you spend time in is suitable. Avoid areas where bad habits are easily spreadable. Lesson number four. When, in consequence of heavy rains up country, a river which you wish to ford is swollen and flecked with foam, you must wait until it subsides. The Earl of Warwick attacked King Henry VI during a civil war. After only half an hour of battle, the king was captured. In attempting to escape, many of his soldiers drowned trying to swim across the rain-swollen river nearby. Do not attempt to overcome obstacles when the difficulty is heightened. It may result in a loss of large amounts of resources. Lesson number five. When the enemy is close at hand and remains quiet, he is relying on the natural strength of his position. Skanderbeg, an Ottoman captain, left the army and decided to go back to his native land to take charge of a new rebellion. The night before a battle against the Ottoman Empire, both sides were camped opposite each other. Skanderbeg's men put out all their campfires, and those who were not on guard were directed to rest. The Ottomans made approaches to the camp to try and provoke Skanderbeg's soldiers, but they stayed quiet. The next day, seeing Skanderbeg had positioned his forces at the bottom of a hill, the Ottomans attacked with all their men, expecting a quick victory. Predicting this, Skanderbeg ordered his forces hidden in the forest behind the Ottomans to strike from the rear. The Ottomans' entire army was defeated. Beware if a competitor does not react to your moves, especially if you cannot see their advantage. If they do not attack or retreat, it is likely they are confident in their position. Lesson number six. When he keeps aloof and tries to provoke a battle, he is anxious for the other side to advance. Pericles, the general of Athens, refused to give the Spartans a confrontation on land, knowing that the Athenian's strength was their navy. The Athenians were secure behind their defences, with supplies constantly arriving via the sea, 
and hoped to seek peace with the Spartans by frustrating them due to their unsuccessful attacks and provocations. An opponent that avoids an all-out fight does so for a reason. Beware of competitors who provoke. They may be testing you or trying to drain your resources through your response. Lesson number 7. The rising of birds in their flight is the sign of an ambush. Startled beasts indicate that a sudden attack is coming. King Charles VI of France and his escort were travelling through the forest one hot summer morning when a leper dressed in rags rushed up to the king's horse. Ride no further, noble king. Turn back. You are betrayed, he shouted as the king's escort beat the man back. They emerged from the forest at noon. Tired from the sun, a soldier dropped the king's lance which clanged loudly against a steel helmet. Thinking it was an ambush, Charles drew his sword and yelled, Forward against the traitors. They wish to deliver me to the enemy. The king began swinging his sword at his companions, killing several men, including a knight. Learn to correctly read the signs and indicators around you about different types of activity and the presence and movement of others. Lesson number 8. Humble words and increased preparations are signs that the enemy is about to advance. Violent language and driving forward as if to the attack are signs that he will retreat. Harald Hadrada lay siege to a castle as part of his conquest to become king of Norway. Before a battle took place, his soldiers went to the castle to inform them of Harald's death. They humbly asked the priests in the castle if the king could be buried within their city. Thinking they would receive gifts for accommodating such a request, the priests accepted. His coffin and a small group of men were allowed into the castle. Once they entered, King Harald leapt from the coffin, declared that everyone should be killed and called his remaining men to battle. Be prepared for enemies trying to deceive you with words and actions by trying to appear as something they are not. Cambyses, the Persian ruler, sent spies acting as ambassadors to Ethiopia, offering friendship. They presented beautiful gifts to impress the Ethiopian king but he saw through the pretend friendship. He gave the ambassadors a gift in return, a gigantic heavy bow, and informed the Persians not to attack until they had the strength to string the bow. Understand the values that your opponents follow. If they act in the same way as you but have different values, then without any formal agreement they may be trying to deceive you. Lesson number 10. If the enemy sees an advantage to be gained and makes no effort to secure it, the soldiers are exhausted. The German plan to sweep through France in World War I came to an end when the French army counterattacked in the Battle of the Marne. The Germans' retreat was caused partly by the exhaustion of many of the German forces. Some of the men had marched more than 150 miles, fighting often along the way. Grasp opportunity and potential advantages quickly, as they easily pass. If opponents do not make attempts to seize an advantage, it may be because they lack the energy to do so meaning they are more suitable to attack. Lesson number 11. When an army feeds its horses with grain and kills its cattle for food, and when the men do not hang their cooking pots over the campfires showing that they will not return to their tents, you may know that they are determined to fight to the death. During the Prussian forces attempt to capture Paris, a severe shortage of food led to locals being forced to slaughter any animals that were around. Rats, dogs and cats were regularly served in restaurants. Horse meat was eaten too, as the horses were eating grain that was needed by the local population. Look for signs of opponents not preparing for the future. It may be an indicator of desperation, as they think they will not survive in the long term. Lesson number 12. Too frequent rewards signify that the enemy is at the end of his resources. Too many punishments betray a condition of dire distress. Mercenaries have been used throughout history in many conflicts. In the 1500s, Niccolo Machiavelli argued against the use of mercenary armies, stating that since the only motivation of mercenaries is their financial reward, and they are less likely to take the kind of risks in battle that may cost them their lives. He believed citizens with a real attachment to their home country will be more motivated to defend it, and therefore will make much better soldiers. Rewards motivate. The less motivated the person, the more rewards needed to motivate them. Be careful not to overuse rewards as it indicates something is potentially wrong. Lesson number 13. If our troops are no more in number than the enemy, that is amply sufficient. 
it only means that no direct attack can be made. What we can do is simply to concentrate all our available strength, keep a close watch on the enemy and obtain reinforcements. Philip II of Macedon attacked the Greeks, with his son Alexander the Great leading a wing of his army. With armies of similar numbers, after an initial direct attack, many soldiers fell on both sides. Philip's faint withdrawal on one wing lured the Athenian wing forward, weakening their line and creating a gap for Alexander to charge through. Philip's superior tactics led to a crushing victory. When you have many tactics available to use, a direct conflict with an equal force is risky and wasteful. Use your superior skill in other ways. Lesson number 14. He who exercises no forethought, but makes light of his opponents, is sure to be captured by them. The disastrous British charge of the Light Brigade was a suicidal charge into Russian heavy guns. Seeing the Russians taking away some captured British guns, Lord Raglan tried to stop them and made an emotional rather than tactical decision. A combination of lack of planning and inefficient communication led to men charging down the wrong valley attacking the wrong target. Always think before acting. Victories are won in the planning, even though the plans may have to change once being carried out. Lesson number 15. If in training soldiers commands are habitually enforced, the army will be well disciplined. If not, its discipline will be bad. Frederick the Great said that his soldiers must fear their officers more than they fear the enemy. The Prussian leader was famous for the harsh discipline he inflicted on his men. One form of punishment included assembling two ranks of soldiers, with the offender made to walk between them, being lashed by each man as he passed. Never let a command be ignored, as this teaches people that commands are optional. Once given, a command should be seen through. If the command later appears ill-judged, it can be changed with another firm command. Lesson number 16. If a general shows confidence in his men, but always insists on his orders being obeyed, the gain will be mutual. Leonidas had full confidence in his men, as he knew they had been disciplined and well trained from a young age. He was in turn rewarded with their loyalty. 300 Spartans stood by his side as they were hacked down by the Persians at the Battle of Thermopylae. When you expect high performance from people and they seek your approval, then they will strive to meet your expectations. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, we may distinguish six kinds of terrain to wit. One, accessible ground. Two, entangling ground. Three, temporizing ground. Four, narrow passes. Five, precipitous heights. Six, positions at a great distance from the enemy. Ground which can be freely traversed by both sides is called accessible. For soldiers fighting throughout history, Terrain referred to the physical ground they were fighting on. In the modern world, it can refer to the economic environment. Both have the same effects. Some terrain can be altered, and some cannot. It did not take long since the development of the internet for people to realise that they could make money online. The market was extremely accessible, with low barriers to entry meaning it was easier to make money than ever before. However, cheap costs and accessible conditions meant the market soon contained lots of competitors all vying for a piece of the financial pie. Be aware that if something is accessible to you, it may be accessible to your enemies too. If you reach the top, it can be easy for somebody to take that spot away from you. Lesson number two. Ground which can be abandoned but is hard to reoccupy is called entangling. The Chinese had taken a key hill in the Korean War from the US and Canadian armies. After trying to recapture the hill without success, they eventually sent up a scouting and sniper team led by French Canadian Leo Major. By silently climbing the hill, they then used the cover of darkness to open fire and panic the Chinese troops, who were expecting the attack to come from outside their territory rather than from within it. This barrage helped the team finally recapture the hill in the early hours. Ground that is hard to reoccupy, such as a hill, forest, or a market monopoly, are important to keep once you occupy them. As it is good to defend entangling ground, you should attempt to prevent enemies from taking it. Lesson number three. 
When the position is such that neither side will gain by making the first move, it is called temporising ground. Stalemate occurred on the Western Front in World War I as German troops became exhausted from covering up to 25 miles a day. Both sides were digging trenches to stop themselves from being killed and using sitting machine guns to inflict heavy losses to any attack from the enemy. Be wary of being enticed out of a strong position, particularly if your rival is also in a strong spot. If going forward could lead to disadvantage, look to go in a different direction. Lesson number 4. With regard to narrow passes, if you can occupy them first, let them be strongly garrisoned and await the advent of the enemy. Despite being severely outnumbered, the Greeks, led by Spartan King Leonidas, held the narrow mountain pass of Thermopylae for days by blocking the only road the large Persian army could pass. Certain environments, if reached first, can be held with ease using a small amount of resource. If you find the opponent is already there, it may be ineffective to attack. Lesson number 5. With regard to precipitous heights, if you are beforehand with your adversary, you should occupy the raised and sunny spots and there wait for him to come up. Julius Caesar's forces took on Pompey the Great's Spanish army in the Great Roman Civil War. After Pompey's men had camped on a hill, Caesar decided to camp close to the foot of it. In the springtime, a combination of several storms and the snow melting from the mountains led to flooding, which in particular affected the lower land. Caesar's troops could not forage for food, leading to famine and disease. Occupying a high position has natural advantages. If you are battling a higher, stronger enemy, the best tactics are trickery and surprise. Lesson number 6. If you are situated at a great distance from the enemy and the strength of the two armies is equal, it is not easy to provoke a battle and fighting will be to your disadvantage. The Grande Armée began their invasion of Russia travelling vast distances on horseback and on foot. Napoleon made the mistake of exhausting his horses by having them carry men, heavy weapons and provisions. He lost thousands of them as a result. This badly restricted how effective the French troops were as it interrupted the supplies that were required for such a large amount of men to live on the road. If you want to compete but are a long distance away, be aware that the time and effort to get into position may leave you in a poor position to challenge. Lesson number 7. Now an army is exposed to six several calamities, not arising from natural causes but from faults for which the general is responsible. These are 1. Flight 2. Insubordination 3. Collapse 4. Ruin 5. Disorganisation 6. Rout Other conditions being equal, if one force is held against another ten times its size, the result will be the flight of the former. Papaflesus positioned his Greek soldiers so that they had a decent view of the plain ahead and awaited the enemy. After Ibrahim's enormous Egyptian army arrived for them to see, some of the Greeks lost courage and when night fell, many of them fled from the field of battle. Despite losing some of his men, Papaflesus valiantly fought on. After he was defeated and killed, his body was placed on a post as a mark of respect from his opponent. When facing a much larger foe, taking them on directly is foolish. Even if you are the stronger outfit, avoid a direct conflict. Instead, stay away from wasting resources by using superior tactics. Lesson number 8. When the common soldiers are too strong and their officers too weak, the result is insubordination. When the officers are too strong and the common soldiers too weak, the result is collapse. King Edward II was indecisive and weak. As a result, he invaded Scotland without the backing of one of his most powerful noblemen, Thomas of Lancaster. Edward's remaining nobles argued over who should have the role of leader prior to a battle, and once the battle began, the English were completely defeated. It is bad if your commands are weak, but it is worse if you allow your commands to be disobeyed. Lesson number 9. When the higher officers are angry and insubordinate, and on meeting the enemy give battle on their own account from a feeling of resentment, before the commander-in-chief can tell whether or not he is in a position to fight, the result is ruin. An overconfident Roman general, Lucius Licinius Morena, ignored orders to stop his operations against the kingdom of Pontus. He provoked a war by launching raids into the kingdom, despite his senate telling him not to. At a river, the Romans had captured a small number of Pontic troops, but spared their lives for too long. The larger Pontic army arrived, and together they attacked the badly prepared Romans, forcing them to retreat and lose the battle. Coordinate your actions with others, and work with them to succeed. Failure to do so in a business could mean many departments working independently and seeking their own successes, potentially at the expense of the others. 
Lesson number 10. When the general is weak and without authority, when his orders are not clear and distinct, when there are no fixes duties assigned to officers and men, and the ranks are formed in a slovenly, haphazard manner, the result is utter disorganisation. The secret of war lies in the communications. Napoleon Bonaparte. More specifically, General Baden-Powell added, The secret of getting successful work out of your trained men lies in one nutshell, in the clearness of the instructions they receive. The higher an officer is in the army, the stronger and clearer his commands must be. A failure in communication at any point causes problems to all subordinate officers. Always be aware of the intent of the leader. This is vital, as if you cannot communicate, you will still know the ultimate goal, and can use your own initiative to achieve it. Lesson number 11. When a general, unable to estimate the enemy's strength, allows an inferior force to engage a larger one, or hurls a weak detachment against a powerful one, and neglects to place picked soldiers in the front rank, the result must be rout. Publius Quintilius Varus led his Roman legions into a forest, without sending any appropriate scouts ahead of him. His arrogance caused him to ignore warnings from other noblemen about his opponent's trickery, and he didn't even listen to direct threats from his enemy. The tribes under Arminius ambushed the Romans in the forest. Unable to get into battle positions, Varus and his men were slaughtered. Intelligence is key, and it is crucial to know your opponent's strengths. In business, who you put on the front line will greatly affect the first impression you present. Lesson number 12. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight, even though the ruler forbid it. If fighting will not result in victory, then you must not fight, even at the ruler's bidding. Prince Frederick Charles criticised a major for messing up a situation. But I was following an order. Aren't orders from a superior officer to be treated as if they were issued by the king himself? Said the major. The prince replied, His majesty made you a major because he believed you would know when not to obey his orders. German officers were taught that they were personally responsible for results, not for following orders. If the orders led to a mistake, following them is not a valid excuse. If an officer was aware of a problem, it was their personal responsibility to do something about it and take decisive action. Erwin Rommel ignored many orders from Berlin when he served in the Second World War. He ignored them on the grounds that he better appreciated the situation than his superiors, as he had more experience and served in the previous World War. He got away with it because he delivered victories. Hitler was said to be thrilled at his initiative. It is important you obey leaders, but when a choice has to be made in the heat of the moment, do what is right to achieve the overall victory. Allow those below you to do this too, and ensure they are trained to make these decisions correctly. Lesson number 13. The general who advances without coveting fame, and retreats without fearing disgrace, whose only thought is to protect his country and do good service for his sovereign, is the jewel of the kingdom. To deal with a French invasion, Russian leaders implemented tactics of strategically retreating to avoid a major battle with a large force that they would probably lose. This drew the French into a long drawn out affair they hadn't prepared for. The large French army slowly diminished in size due to a lack of supplies, and most of the men had perished by the time they got to Moscow. Retreating is not often seen as a positive approach. As the Duke of Wellington once said, the hardest thing of all for a soldier is to retreat. However, the ability to extract yourself from a desperate situation is crucial, as it will allow you to fight another day. Lesson number 14. Regard your soldiers as your children, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. Look upon them as your own beloved sons, and they will stand by you, even unto death. Napoleon Bonaparte understood that an army would fight better if they knew that they would be taken care of when they became injured. In an attempt to better motivate his troops, he moved his medical personnel as close to the battlefield as possible, so that injured soldiers received immediate medical treatment. Napoleon believed that because of this, his soldiers would be more inspired to fight with a fierce effort, safe in the knowledge they'd be looked after if they were wounded. Build a bond with people by actively caring for them if you want them to trust and follow you. Lesson number 15. The experienced soldier, once in motion, is never bewildered. Once he has broken camp, he is never at a loss. To carry out the fighting techniques that the Romans developed, new recruits to the army were required to be disciplined and very fit. They were sent to the front line in battle, with more experienced soldiers behind them. This would increase the new recruits' confidence, knowing they had battle-hardened troops behind them, but it also stopped them from deserting the battlefield if they lost courage. 
Most importantly, the Romans valued their experienced soldiers, and those at the front were more likely to be killed. Value your experience, as it is an important asset. If you lack experience, use innovation to compensate for this limitation. Lesson number 16. If you know the enemy and know yourself, your victory will not stand in doubt. If you know heaven and know earth, you may make your victory complete. As previously mentioned, a reason the Roman massacre in the Teutoburg forest occurred was because of a severe lack of knowledge and an ignorance of the enemy. Varus didn't take into account his army was excellent at fighting in formation using open spaces, and he also ignored the fact that Arminius's tribes excelled at ambushes in the forest terrain. The end result was possibly the greatest disaster in the history of the Roman military. Know yourself, know your opponent, and know your environment. All these factors should be considered and will assist you with your decisions of which tactics should be used to determine victory. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, the art of war recognises nine varieties of ground. When a chieftain is fighting in his own territory, it is dispersive ground. On dispersive ground, fight not. Joan of Arc was a victorious commander in many battles during the Hundred Years' War in France, but what was arguably just as impressive was that as she approached with her army, 30 towns and cities surrendered without a fight. These places had been invaded by the English and their allies, However, Joan's presence on the front line inspired the French troops while simultaneously intimidating the English. The fear that Joan of Arc caused stemmed from a letter she wrote prior to her first battle. Writing to the English, she demanded they surrender all the cities they captured in France and leave the country. Anybody who disobeyed her request would be killed. Her initial aggressive attacks showed they were not empty threats and frightened future targets to the point where they capitulated without any blood being spilt. Alexander the Great won many battles with the sword, but so did Martin Luther King using other methods. Winning without fighting on your own land requires you to change the heart and mind of your opponent. Use the advantage of knowing your own turf to make an opponent realise they do not have a chance. Lesson number two. When he has penetrated into hostile territory, but to no great distance, it is facile ground. On facile ground, halt not. In 1775, the US Continental Army tried to capture Quebec and persuade the rest of Canada to join their rebellion. After initially entering Canada, they took several cities and forts, but after losing a battle at Quebec City, they then decided to try to siege the city, which proved disastrous and gave time for the British to send reinforcements to the area. The Americans were forced to retreat and lost all the territory they had originally taken. The element of surprise and being close to home makes the early part of an invasion easier. Do not stop moving when first entering enemy territory, as losing a battle could leave your land open to attack. Lesson number three. Ground the possession of which imports great advantage to either side is contentious ground. On contentious ground, attack not. General Frederick Weisiger led most of his British soldiers from their camp to attack what he thought was the main Zulu force as part of the British invasion in Zululand. Weisiger had failed to set up his camp defensively and ignored information that the Zulus were close by. He was tempted away by a smaller Zulu force that were creating a diversion, leaving the main Zulu army to attack the camp. The camp was annihilated and the British were forced to retreat out of Zululand. If you are on ground which would be advantageous to both you and your opponent, these are where battles are often at their fiercest. You are likely to be attacked on this ground, so your first priority should be to defend it rather than pushing on to attack. Lesson number four. Ground on which each side has liberty of movement is open ground. On open ground, do not try to block the enemy's way. Trying to block an enemy on open ground leaves you susceptible to be attacked from more than one side. In extreme circumstances, you could be completely surrounded. This is what happened at the Battle of Cannae between Hannibal's Carthaginian army and the Roman forces led by two commanders, Pharaoh and Paulus. Hannibal had won previous battles using trickery so Pharaoh wanted warfare in an open battlefield where his larger army could not be ambushed by hidden soldiers. Paulus was more cautious 
believing it was foolish to fight on open ground. When the two forces met each other, Hannibal had weakened his infantry in the centre and ordered them to implement a controlled retreat. Using a pincer movement, Hannibal then managed to surround the entire Roman army with his quicker, stronger flanks and kill nearly all of them. When on ground where you can move easily, use quick movements to deflect and manoeuvre the enemy into positions where you can overpower them. Be vigilant as both sides have the same ease of movement. Lesson number 5. Ground which forms the key to three contiguous states, so that he who occupies it first has most of the empire at his command, is a ground of intersecting highways. On the ground of intersecting highways, join hands with your allies. As Napoleon expanded his kingdom, he was at war with three other empires, Britain, Prussia and Russia. He headed east into what used to be Poland. Prussia, Austria and Russia had each taken chunks of Polish territory so that it no longer existed as a state. So when Napoleon turned up in Warsaw, many Poles turned to him for help and joined the French against Russia and Prussia. Napoleon used the strategy of isolating his enemies and taking them out one at a time. In Polish territory, he met Tsar Alexander of Russia in peace talks and they became allies. Frederick William of Prussia was left out from the discussions and as a result, his empire lost out when the land boundaries were redrawn. If in a position where there are many rivals with different objectives and many possible directions to go, join together with allies who have similar interests to take control. Lesson number 6. When an army is penetrated into the heart of a hostile country, leaving a number of fortified cities in its rear, it is serious ground. On serious ground, gather in plunder. Germanicus went on a punitive expedition to attack the Germanic tribes that had previously destroyed several Roman legions in battle. His intention was to terrorise the enemy by pillaging and burning deep in their territory. Rather than leading to a battle and confrontation, these raids were designed to strike fear into the opponents by highlighting the consequences of acting against the Roman Empire. The speed and destructiveness of the raids maximised the psychological impact by exposing how vulnerable the enemy was. If you are in an area where the enemy is all around you, great caution and vigilance is required. Where your opponent can approach, take what you can and move on. Lesson number 7. Mountain forests, rugged steeps, marshes and fens, all country that is hard to traverse, this is difficult ground. In difficult ground, keep steadily on the march. Let the Austrians do what they will with the Tyrol. Under no circumstances do I want to become engaged in a mountain-based war. Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon's words about mountain warfare proved to be wise, as Andreas Holfer led a rebellion of peasants against the occupation of their homeland by French and Bavarian troops. The peasants employed guerrilla tactics up in the mountains by being highly mobile and using sharpshooting skills to pick off their opponents. The soldiers were used to fighting on a battlefield and weren't familiar with the terrain. The peasants utilised the difficult ground by creating artificial avalanches. The end result was thousands of soldiers killed and captured weapons that would supply the rebels for months. If passing through some land is difficult, keep going, as stopping could prove even more hazardous. Do not engage your opponent in these tough circumstances. Lesson number 8. Ground which is reached through narrow gorges and from which we can only retire by tortuous paths, so that a small number of the enemy would suffice to crush a large body of our men. This is hemmed in ground. On hemmed in ground, resort to stratagem. When Hannibal was hemmed in on a road surrounded by mountains by his opponent Fabius, he devised a cunning strategic plan to escape. At nightfall, he tied bundles of twigs to the horns of 2,000 oxen and then set the twigs on fire. The bizarre show of lights moving extremely quickly down the road, which Fabius's men did not know were terrified oxen, caused them to panic and leave their position on the road, allowing Hannibal and his troops to pass through unharmed. If a path is narrow with limited access, it could be a great area to protect, but could also lead the possibility of being trapped. Employ the right strategy to use it to your advantage. Lesson number 9. Ground on which we can only be saved from destruction by fighting without delay is desperate ground. On desperate ground, fight. On D-Day, as the Allied landing crafts got as close to the beaches of Normandy as possible without running ashore, the Allied soldiers inside were left with a decision. Listening to the bullets hitting the outside of the boats, 
They knew that once the door opened, they would have to wade through the water to the beach, facing oncoming fire in a very vulnerable and exposed position. There was a chance they would not even make it out of the boat at all. However, in these circumstances, there was no point staying in the vessel. The mentality required at that moment, in such a desperate situation, is that of do or die. They may die anyway, but there's no point in standing still. In such a position, the only positive decision is to move, even if it is into the unknown. What these men did took extraordinary character, stepping forward without knowing what would happen, but doing it for victory, if not for themselves, then for others. When your back is against the wall, and you are in a desperate situation that requires strong character, you have no option but to fight. Lesson number one. In order to carry out an attack, we must have means available. The material for raising fire should always be kept in readiness. Hugh Capet led his men to besiege the town of Laon in France. One night, Capet's troops were resting at their camp just outside the town and became drunk. Duke Charles and his men who were protecting the town took advantage of this by being prepared. They had already assembled the tools and materials needed to start large fires and left the town with this equipment to hand. They torched Capet's camp and by setting fire to it, forced him to abandon the siege altogether. Fire is a resource that can be used for an opportunistic attack. Use the environment to your advantage by having your resources prepared, available and always ready to be used. Lesson number two. In attacking with fire, one should be prepared to meet five possible developments. When fire breaks out inside the enemy's camp, respond at once with an attack from without. When William of Normandy attacked a castle in Mayenne, he ordered his army to shoot fire into it in an attempt to alarm the enemy inside. As this was taking place and panic was setting in among his opponents, William sent two boys to sneak into the castle from the outside. Their aim was to start another fire, which they did, and resulted in the castle garrison soon surrendering. If soldiers are forced to put out fire in their own camp, they are more vulnerable to external attack. This principle can be utilised in business by attacking your competitors when they are distracted. Lesson number three. If there is an outbreak of fire, but the enemy's soldiers remain quiet, bide your time and do not attack. In the Second World War, Japanese Major General Kusaba's men devised the concept of using fire balloons to float over and attack the US mainland. The balloons were inflated with hydrogen and carried bombs and sandbags, with the aim to incite fear and terror throughout America. There was a strong danger that these balloons could create forest wildfires on impact. The psychological effect on the American people could have been huge, so US authorities ordered the media to keep quiet about any balloon incidents. They did not want to let their enemy know of their potential effectiveness. Despite a low success rate, US authorities were still worried and didn't even know where the balloons were coming from. They took some of the sand from the sandbags to a geology unit for investigation. There they discovered the sand came from Japan and even pinpointed the specific part of the country it came from. Reconnaissance of the area revealed two hydrogen plants which were then soon destroyed as a result of American bombing. General Kusaba was forced to stop his balloon operations soon afterwards. The normal response to being disturbed by fire is action. A lack of action is unnatural. If the enemy behaves in this way, they may be acting cunningly. When competitors act strangely around you, be suspicious. Lesson number four. When the force of the flames has reached its height, follow it up with an attack if that is practicable. If not, stay where you are. The northern warlord Cao Cao took on his southern counterparts Liu Bei and Sun Huan in the Battle of Red Cliffs. In an attempt to reduce seasickness in his navy, Cao Cao chained all his ships together. Seeing this, the southern warlord sent a letter pretending to surrender and prepared a squadron of ships to sail over to Cao Cao's larger forces. The squadron actually consisted of fire ships carrying kindling and oil. As they approached, the ships were set on fire and the sailors jumped off into smaller boats. The fire ships crashed into Cao Cao's fleet, causing a large blaze and the loss of several men. After this initial shock of the impact, the southern allies sent an armed force to capitalise on the fire attack. There was confusion amongst the northern troops and their army was completely defeated, causing Cao Cao to order a retreat. When flames are at their highest, 
the chaos within the enemy will also be at its peak. The best time to attack is when there is the most confusion. However, it is not always a good idea to attack after fire, especially when entering an unknown environment. Lesson number 5. If it is possible to make an assault with fire from without, do not wait for it to break out within, but deliver your attack at a favourable moment. The Castilians took on the English in a naval battle during the Hundred Year War and waited for the perfect time to attack. When the tide was low, English ships were left aground. The following morning, the Castilians used this tactical advantage by spraying oil onto the English ships and then, from some distance away, set fire to the ships by shooting flaming arrows onto the decks. The whole fleet was destroyed and the English were defeated. You do not always need to enter an enemy's camp to set fire to it. Time your attacks to coincide with the moments where you have the greatest advantage. Lesson number 6. When you start a fire, be to windward of it. Do not attack from the leeward. The King of Mercia, Penda, unable to capture a castle by force, decided to set the city ablaze instead. Building a pile of flammable material such as wood, straw and branches at the bottom of the castle, he then set fire to it. However, the wind changed direction and blew the fire into his own men, causing the attack to be abandoned. Fire travels in the same direction as the wind. If the wind or other environmental factors are unpredictable, starting an attack may be dangerous for you. Take action where the outcome will be more certain. Lesson number 7. Hence those who use fire as an aid to the attack show intelligence. Those who use water as an aid to the attack gain an ascension of strength. Fire can be used as a form of attack and defence. When the Athenians attacked the city of Syracuse in Sicily, they lost many of their siege engines to fire when trying to break down the city walls. Two decades later, Dionysius I had taken note of what had occurred to the Athenians. When he was besieging the nearby city of Motia, he organised groups of men to act as fire brigades and douse any flames when his own siege engines were attacked. Make sure you understand all the elements of your environment. In business, resources used to compete are found all around you. Use creative thought to utilise them and gain a competitive advantage. Lesson number 8. Unhappy is the fate of one who tries to win his battles and succeed in his attacks without cultivating the spirit of enterprise for the result is waste of time and general stagnation. The Byzantines invented the weapon now known as Greek fire. The machine that was often positioned on board ships would release liquid fire in a similar way to a modern flamethrower, destroying enemies that approached alongside. What made this interesting idea for a weapon even more intriguing was that the flames continued to burn on the water. To this day, it is not known which ingredients were used to create the flammable mixture used by the machine. Innovate and use the ingenuity and ideas of people around you. Leverage people's talents by actively encouraging them in others rather than suppressing them. Lesson number 9. Move not unless you see an advantage. Use not your troops unless there is something to be gained. Fight not unless the position is critical. Napoleon Bonaparte used many examples from the art of war in his military campaigns and added his own thoughts on when to use his men. You must avoid countermanding orders. Unless the soldier can see a good reason for benefit, he becomes discouraged and loses confidence. Action without advantage is a waste. By acting without seeing any possible advantage, you greatly risk disadvantage. Lesson number 10. No ruler should put troops into the field merely to gratify his own spleen. No general should fight a battle simply out of pique. General Ulysses Grant's temper got the better of him at the Battle of Cold Harbour after the trench fighting became a long and drawn out affair. After arguing with the other officers, Grant made it known that he was going to break through the enemy lines that day. The resulting head-on assaults on the enemy, who were in fortified positions, led to the death of thousands of Grant's men. Pride comes before the fall. If you are overconfident or too arrogant, you are likely to fail. Ensure you are ruled by your head rather than by your emotions. Don't rely solely on gut feeling when making decisions. Lesson number 11. Hence the enlightened ruler is heedful and the good general full of caution. This is the way to keep a country at peace and an army intact. In World War II, British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery was appointed as a commander in North Africa by Winston Churchill to take on German General Erwin Rommel. Rommel had been successful and pushed back Allied troops, 
but Montgomery restored the Allied men's confidence and forced Rommel to retreat, leading to the Germans' eventual surrender in Africa. Montgomery achieved this feat by being a cautious and thorough strategist. Before any attempt at an attack, he demanded that his men were completely ready and all the required equipment was fully available. This resulted in very slow but steady success. It also confirmed his popularity with his troops. Ensure you fight only when you need to and avoid unnecessary harm. Lesson number one. Sun Tzu said, What enables the wise sovereign and the good general to strike and conquer, and achieve things beyond the reach of ordinary men, is foreknowledge. Genghis Khan ruled his Mongol Empire with the help of his primary military strategist, Subutai. Subutai was one of the most successful commanders in history, thanks in part to ensuring a combination of scouting and spying in advance of any invasion. Before the invasion of Europe, Subutai spent a decade sending spies deep into the continent. He made maps of the Roman roads, established trade routes and made well-educated guesses on the ability of each principality to resist capture. Foreknowledge is the knowing of future events. When this is not possible, learn to forecast the likely behaviour of opponents. Seek out their strengths, plans and positioning. Real intelligence beats guesswork and at the heart of all good decisions is knowledge. Lesson number two. Now this foreknowledge cannot be elicited from spirits. It cannot be obtained inductively from experience, nor by any deductive calculation. George Washington led his men across a river in a surprise attack to capture a group of Hessian mercenaries. After the Hessian commander was killed, an unopened letter was found in his pocket, written by a loyalist, giving him advanced warning of the attack. If you make your decisions using boldness and gut feeling, rather than reliable information, you are gambling. Making decisions based on bad knowledge will also prove ineffective. Lesson number three. Hence the use of spies, of whom there are five classes. Local spies, inward spies, converted spies, doomed spies, surviving spies. When these five kinds of spy are all at work, none can discover the secret system. This is called divine manipulation of the threads. It is the sovereign's most precious faculty. Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth, appointed a number of spy masters whose job was to gather all possible information about the enemy through the use of scouts and spies. Cromwell also had a postmaster general in charge of intercepting letters and deciphering codes. The postmaster also influenced the flow of news across the land. Much of Cromwell's success in war was due to the previous knowledge of the enemy's moves he gained in this way. Gaining information on competitors can give you a significant advantage. Lesson number four. Having local spies means employing the services of the inhabitants of a district. In the Crusades, intelligence was crucial. In Northeast Europe, German Teutonic Knights battled the Prussians, Latvians, Estonians and Lithuanians. The Teutonic Knights' castles and Lithuanian settlements were separated by hundreds of miles of wilderness. The Crusaders were helped by local scouts, allowing them to launch regular campaigns across the land. The scouts' local knowledge helped them produce the Lithuanian road reports, which acted as a travel guide for the Crusaders in the Baltic. The reports were compiled over 18 years and specified routes into the hostile territory. Local spies are common people within enemy territory. If the people where the enemy is situated do not like the enemy, you will be able to persuade these individuals to spy for you more easily. Lesson number five, having inward spies, making use of officials of the enemy. Oleg Gordievsky was a colonel of the KGB, but while he was a resident in London in the 1980s, he was also working for the British intelligence service as a secret agent. Having such a high ranking official working with them was extremely valuable to the British. On one occasion, Gordievsky helped avert a potential nuclear confrontation. He was recalled to Moscow and interrogated after coming under suspicion, but escaped by being smuggled out with British help. Internal spies are officials of your opponent. They can be convinced to work for you, either by financial reward or by amplifying an existing discontent they have with the enemy. 
Persuade them you'll win the battle and your chance of turning them is much higher. Lesson number six. Having converted spies, getting hold of the enemy spies and using them for your own purposes. Aldrich Ames had worked for the CIA for 30 years as a counterintelligence officer, but for nine of those years he had been a double agent, passing on American secrets to the Soviet and then Russian intelligence services. He revealed the identity of over 30 American agents, and after 10 of them were executed in the Soviet Union, the FBI began searching for an internal traitor. Ames passed two lie detector tests thanks to his training, but was eventually caught after spending his $4 million payment from the Russians. Converted spies refer to the enemy's own spies being used against them. Beware of enemy spies pretending to be double agents, as they can never be fully trusted and could in fact be acting as triple agents. Lesson number seven, having doomed spies, doing certain things openly for purposes of deception and allowing our spies to know of them and report them to the enemy. During the First World War, Mata Harry, the exotic dancer and high class prostitute, spied for Germany in Paris. She obtained valuable information from being around politicians and military men. In 1917, the French intelligence service intercepted a coded message, which showed she was working as a German spy. She was subsequently arrested and executed. The Germans had known the French had already broken the code and wanted them to read the message. The Germans wanted Harry out of the way and this ensured that the French would do the actual dirty work. Doomed spies are expendable and fed information that is often false, so that it may be discovered by the enemy's own spies. If one of your spies is compromised, you can still use this to your advantage. Have other spies spread information about the doomed spy to your opponent. You may lose one spy, but allow another to gain greater confidence and access to better intelligence. Lesson number eight, surviving spies finally, are those who bring back news from the enemy's camp. Agent Joe Pistone spent six years undercover infiltrating the Mafia. As a spy planted by the FBI, he was given the name Donny Brasco and had access to otherwise unobtainable intelligence. He was therefore a valuable asset that was protected. His total collected evidence led to over 100 Mafia member convictions. Surviving spies are ones who focus on bringing back reports. Spies are only useful if they provide you with information. Lesson number nine. Without subtle ingenuity of mind, one cannot make certain of the truth of spies' reports. While the Romans were besieging the city of Nequinum, two men who lived there dug a tunnel out to a Roman outpost. Offering to secretly escort the Roman soldiers back into the city, the Romans had to confirm whether the men were indeed traitors or whether it was a trap. They decided to hold one of the men as a hostage and send the other through the tunnel accompanied by two Roman scouts. Once it had been determined that the tunnel was not a trap, the Romans sent 300 soldiers through it at night, taking the city by surprise and putting it under Roman rule without fighting. Be aware that spy reports may not be accurate. They may contain weak or even false information. There is also a chance they are working against you. Find ways to verify and confirm what your spies speak of. Lesson number 10. Be subtle, be subtle, and use your spies for every kind of business. In Spartan society, a type of brutal internal surveillance was developed to keep its slave population under control. Young military men were appointed by the state to act as secret police and discover any potential unrest or attempt at a slave revolt. Every year, the Spartan state declared war on its slaves, allowing the Spartan secret police to kill troublesome slaves without fear of punishment. You can use spies in a variety of creative ways, including using them in your own land to find dissenters. You can also position them in other areas to understand and then influence the local environment. Lesson number 11. Whether the object be to crush an army, to storm a city or to assassinate an individual, it is always necessary to begin by finding out the names of the attendants, the aides de camp, the doorkeepers and sentries of the general in command. Our spies must be commissioned to ascertain these. Elizabeth Van Loo was a spy in the American Civil War. As a landowner, she freed all her slaves and then used them as spies and informants behind Confederate lines. Her spy network for the Union Army was so successful that General Ulysses S. Grant later said that the intelligence he received from Van Loo was the best information that he received anywhere and that she was a main factor in them winning the war. When you are on a secret mission, Many seemingly unimportant people who you come in contact with 
can become extremely important. These people can be persuaded to not interfere or perhaps even help, but be wary as they may also see or overhear you and report their findings elsewhere. You can get a lot of information from those who say little but hear much.